another great show. We've got uh, sub issue of the day is uh, Tesla. We've got two experts in the house, uh, Motorhead and uh, Mark Spiegel. Uh, before we get started, uh, just a couple of things. Um, some of you may be wondering <laughs> by dint of what's happened the last couple of weeks that I might have been hiding under my desk. Uh, nothing could be further from, further from the truth. I had a pretty rough bout with COVID. Um, I've been itching to get back, but it really kind of knocked the dickens out of me. So i um, glad to be back um, and doing what I really enjoy, which is following markets and having these discussions. Um, as is our custom, uh, just this date in history, uh, very quickly, as I'm a baseball nut, um, in, on January 28th, let me just find this thing here. On January 28th of uh, 19... So 1900 and 1901, the American League um, was founded. <laughs> the initial eight teams, and I forgot the names of all these. Some of them we know. Um, some of them have changed names. We had the Baltimore. There were there were four. There were um, it was a 140 game schedule, um, and the teams only had 14 men per roster. That's kind of amazing. Now you got 25 man rosters, but the original eight were the Baltimore Orioles. Okay, the the Boston Americans. The Chicago White Stockings. This one I didn't know. The Cleveland Blue. The Detroit Tigers, Philadelphia Athletics, Washington Senators, Milwaukee Brewers. So those are the original eight. I don't know where the Yankees were in that whole thing, whatever. And then just footnotes, less importance in my view. 1930, the Chrysler Building uh, opened. Um, that was at a cost of $15 million to construct. Think about that, $15 million. It was 78 stories high. It towered over the 56-story Woolworths building. It was also um, taller than the Eiffel, Eiffel Tower. And in 1956, Elvis made his first appearance on television. So those are your three dates in history. All right, now to the issue at hand. Um, Tesla, which has been top of mind for most investors, certainly for myself. Um, we've got two... Uh, experienced uh, veterans on Tesla here to weigh in. Uh, he invited a couple of uh, uh, Tesla bulls, um, a couple of smart guys. Uh, they couldn't make it um, due to personal obligations. But if anybody's in the room would like to come up and, uh, you know, talk about the bull case for Tesla, it's always a respectful room. So happy to do that. Um, in deference to uh, schedules, um, I think we're going to have Mark Spiegel actually go first. Mark is a, is a long long standing friend he and i grew up down the road from each other in princeton new jersey knowing each other since we were oh my god 10 years old eight years old whatever um in any event mark and i mark mark has encyclopedic knowledge of uh tesla mark also i think has uh like myself uh not too kindly not too favorably inclined towards the overall market so mark i welcome uh, i want to make this as free form as possible uh maybe we could just start out generally what you're thinking on markets and then go specifically into tesla I mean, clearly there's been a, you know, it's been a, I've certainly been surprised by the strength of the market this year. Um, and what do you think is going on here? You think it's just a temporary dis dislocation and disconnect? Or um, I, I think you do maintain longstanding negative views on the market. So Mark, the floor is yours. Let's talk about the market first and then let's get into Tesla. Mark, good to see you, my friend. Yeah. Hi. Um, so I think that was just a nasty bear market rally. And in fact, I saw up a tweet this morning. Uh, a lot of people noticed without putting it in any context that um this was the best january for nasdaq since 2001 so uh i dug into some some figures it wasn't didn't take too long and you can see that so in 2000 uh the nasdaq was down uh 39 percent and then in january 2001 the nasdaq was up 11 percent for the full year 2001, though, the NASDAQ still finished down 21%. And in answer to somebody's question this morning, that was not because of the, the tragic events, the terrorism of 9-11. In fact, NASDAQ finished much higher on December 31 than it was on September 10th. So that, obviously, that was a fierce bear market January rally of 11% in 2001 following the implosion of a giant bumble, bubble. So what do we have this year? Uh, 2022, 
the NASDAQ was down uh, 33%. This month, the NASDAQ is up 11%, actually 10.7, but pretty much exactly what happened in January 2001. So it is not surprising after a massive bubble implosion to have a counter trend, fierce bear market rally. And of course, you guys know it was led really by garbage stocks. I mean, the S&P, I think, I, I, I'm not sure. I think the S&P is only up around maybe 3% this month. There's three and change, something like that. And, and here you have NASDAQ up, up 11. And of course, you know, so yes, bear market rally. Also 2001, as somebody just pointed out to me on Twitter, the Fed was cutting rates throughout 2001, and it was still down 21% after that fierce January. So obviously now they're, they're still slightly raising rates, and then they're going to hold the rates for, for quite a while. So yeah, this is not a friendly environment for stocks. And um, yeah, I think they're tanking. I, I think we're going to, before this is over, I think we're going to see the S&P at, at least down to 16 times uh, gap earnings, which assuming uh, the assuming Q4 comes in where it looks as if it's coming in, Q4 of 22, the, the ones that are just being reported now, 16 times that would put the S&P in like the 2700s. So that's my target at the moment, you know, for some time later this year. After that, I have no idea what happens. So let's cut back now, to, as, as George said, let's cut back to, to Tesla um, because – Tesla has been the poster child for the for the January craziness. Let me talk about one other thing, by the way, before I get to Tesla, because it's another poster child of, of craziness. And this is not a trade that's easy to put on at this point because there's no borrow. But for months now, I've been short uh, AMC and, and long ape. And a lot of you guys know this trade. But basically, they're identical securities and everything but name. And yet the spread between them had grown to as much as like $5 a share at one point, like ones versus sixes. Uh, now it's about $3. So uh, just same number of shares, short one, long the other. Yesterday, they announced that they're actually holding this vote, which should be a lock, uh, to merge the two share classes. So as of like March 15th, the ape ticker should go away and it should all be the AMC ticker. And yet... <laughs> After this proxy came out last night, about nothing happened with the two stocks for, I don't know, an hour. And then after that, you know, they closed together a little bit, but the spread ended at like $3. I thought it was just hilarious that, that there were actually idiots out there buying AMC shares at, um, you know, $5 and uh, last night at like $5.35 when they could have owned all the ape they wanted at, at like $2.30 after the pop. In other words, there was still a $3 spread. Now, why anybody, if you want to be long this business at all, which is a horrible business, why, why anybody would buy you know, a share of AMC last night instead of a share of ape, where you can basically own like you know, two and a half or three, almost three times as much of the company for the same price, it's beyond me. But the reason I use that story is just to illustrate how like the idiots have sort of been in charge again this month. And it's just, in my opinion, and I'm sure George's, it's just an echo bubble. And Tesla's the poster child of that. And there was a great article in the Wall Street Journal yesterday and then updated last night because, of course, Tesla absolutely soared last night. And it's up, you know, I think 44 percent this month. And 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 off the intraday lows, it's up. Uh, you know, like over 70 percent. So yesterday, apparently, 13 percent of all option trading across all exchanges were Tesla options. <laughs> and most of them, you know, short term, probably calls that expired yesterday, you know, 5, 10, 15 out of the money. And of course, that that option gamma is what drove the stock through the roof, despite a really awful um, sort of fundamental outlook for the company due to the massive price cutting. I mean, the bottom line is, I have no doubt Tesla will meet its delivery guidance, which must put it 1.8 million, maybe as high as, as 2 million. I also have no doubt that Tesla gap earnings this year, 2023, 
will be at least 30% lower than 2022's earnings. This is no longer a growth stock. It's no longer, not that it ever was, but it's impossible to argue with the margins we're about to see that it's a quote unquote tech stock. It's just a car company. It's just a car company. And car companies now are selling at like, you know, six times earnings. I mean, I own Stellantis at three times earnings, you know, Volkswagen at four times earnings. And actually, Volkswagen is completely free if you factor out its Porsche ownership on that IPO. So for anybody to buy Tesla, I mean, Tesla will be lucky to earn $3 a share gap this year. I'm pretty sure it's going to be in the two handles. But even if you say it's going to be $3, you're paying, you know, right now, almost 60 times earnings for, for a company that should be selling at six times earnings because it is no better than any other car company. Of course, the sexy new story for the, I, I call them Tesla lemmings, is like that the battery business is going to be so great. Well, you know, it's a terrible, shitty, highly competitive business, battery storage. I mean, you know, the, Tesla has to compete against its suppliers, at least for now, if it ever gets its own factory going in any size, great. But those guys have like net margins in like the low single digits in their battery businesses. I mean, you know, LG, um, um, Panasonic, wh whatever, I assume CATL. I mean, Tesla's gross margin in that business, uh, including solar, was was 12 percent last quarter. So it's a lousy business that will get, you know, a, that should get a multiple no better than the auto business, may, maybe even worse. So. You know, Tesla's got 3.2 billion shares outstanding, approximately, right? So, you know, one times revenue for, 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 their, for their storage business right now is worth less than $2 a share, you know? And one times revenue is a fat price for a crappy business like that. So that, that's, my, that's my overview. Back to you, George. That was terrific, Mark. Um, and I think... Uh... Probably, should, probably uh, Motorhead will get Motorhead in the mix here now because I think his views are uh, largely consistent with yours. It'd be good to get a sort of back and forth going here. So Motorhead, welcome. Uh, good to see you again. Um, so uh, floor is yours, Motorhead. Thanks, George. Um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's astounding uh, how much the price has risen since um, the January 6th or 7th, um, you know, price cut announcement uh and um i've never seen i've been covering the auto sector for you know almost you know, over three decades now and um i've never seen anything like this except for in 2005 when uh the big three gm started a, a employees discount you know uh program and um you know uh chrysler followed ford followed uh and uh two of those three went bankrupt in 2008 so um cutting prices once you cut prices from what i've seen over you know three days uh three decades of covering the sector is once you cut prices it's very difficult to to increase them again um and uh if you look at tesla's profitability i mean it it was all i think related to mainly two factors one is the uh, 27 percent um price hikes that they implemented since covid and the other is um, a huge increase in uh, China's production. And that factory, if you, if you back everything out, um, probably generated 92% of their 2021 profits. And they disclose this in their 10K. Um, it'll be interesting to see what the 10K says this time. But they basically um, made no money in the U.S. That's main, mainly because of the... Uh, uh, this, the other, the, the energy business being mixed in there. I, I think Fremont probably generated about four and a half percent profit uh, operating margins and uh, they exported to Europe. So you back all that out. China was 92 percent. What you've got in 2023 is actually really, I mean, scary. If you if you look at it from an automotive standpoint, you've got the um, the ramp up of Austin and uh, Grundheide happening in Germany. And um I modeled this out, but they need to hire about another 7,000 to 9,000 line workers. Um, in Germany, they're having problems finding enough line workers. And um, 
they have to ramp those those factories because they only ran at around 15 percent of uh, installed capacity last year. And because they recognize de depreciation on a per unit basis, depreciation is going to spike. Labor costs are going to spike. So I've got I've got um, fixed costs alone going up by 30 percent. OK, so what else can you cut then? Um, it comes down to raw materials or uh, components. And um, on the conference call, they said that they would uh, lower, uh, lower their costs uh, on the logistics side. Um, I don't see that happening. Most car makers these days are saying that their logistic costs will be a headwind in, um, in 2023. Steel prices are down, but if China reopens uh, with a vengeance in the second half, um, you could see steel prices spiking as well. That's that's a large part of uh, uh, the cost of goods sold per vehicle. Uh, lithium, they admit it. Lithium prices are going to go up for them. And if you just go purely by the uh, uh, the uh, spot prices, um, lithium has gone from like $400 uh, per battery pack at Tesla to about 4400 And if those prices increase, which they indicated they will, um, it's it's really hard to see variable cost per per unit declining. So I, I in my model I, I take take variable cost per unit down by two percent. I lower prices by fifteen percent, and I think I think that's really generous because um, if you look at what's causing what prompted these price cuts, it's basically um, it's basically the uh, you know uh, uh, people not wanting to be seen in a Tesla. And there was also a lot of Tesla flipping going on. So they, they would buy a Tesla and resell it on the used so, market for several thousand dollars, you know, premium. But so, the, uh, so, so Motorhead, just let's just get into the numbers a little bit this specifically. So I just put up in the nest um, and uh, Jim Chanos is um, uh, she sets out the uh, gross margins by quarter X um, the Zev credits and. You know, if you look in the nest, and you have your own numbers, but I think including including all the credits, they were what they were like 24, 25 percent in the most recent quarter. And when what are you what are you modeling for uh, uh, gross margin? I mean, if you if you have a, if you have a, a price cut of 10, 12, 15 percent, Mark, questions for you as well. I mean, the numbers are pretty straightforward. If you have a 25 percent, 24 percent gross margin, plug in whatever price cut you want on average for. 2023 what does that do motorhead and first motorhead then mark what does that do to your to you let's keep it simple what does that do to your operating margin gross margin your operating margin motorhead yeah i i basically see um gross margins uh give me one second here sorry um uh gross margins are probably going to go to crap forgive me um mark why don't you go first no uh, first first of all Let's use Q4 as a run rate because um, yep. that's the Perfect. that's the most realist idea of what's going on. So Q Q1 and so far all of all of this year prices look to me and Motorhead, you can correct me, as if it's around a 12% on average cut versus Q4. So basically, you know, I did I, I even went further in than that based on ASPs. I said okay. They probably made around net around nine thousand a car in Q4, and 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 by the way, I included the the credits, and I also included the the full self driving re revenue recognition. Of course, full self driving is a total fraud and a liability, and I think at one point they're going to have to refund all that money. But I was willing to include it because I think I heard them say they had a, a currency loss, which was about equivalent to the FSD revenue. That they recognized, and by the way, that's probably not a coincidence. Um, so, <laughs> so, and the reason I'm not eliminating the ZEV credits, or let's just it's not just ZEV, let's call it emission credits, is because that's a little bit of a. They were fat this quarter, right? They were over 600 million, which is a lot. But on the other hand, as their ability to sell emission credits goes away, because fewer, no one will have to buy them pretty soon because they'll have enough of their own. They're going to start booking at least in the U.S., some battery credits, like half of the roughly $3,900 per battery from Panasonic. They said Panasonic splitting it with them. They didn't say half, but I'll give them that assumption. And then if they ever can get their own factories going, 
you know, they can collect another 3,900 for each battery pack they made. So I'll just pretend that the gap number for Q4 is was actually, you know, a real number and doesn't need adjustment just for pretending sake. And you do all that stuff and and the, the net profit per car, I think this year uh, goes from like the 9,000s to maybe um, maybe five thousand dollars, and that difference is what I think drops EPS into like uh, you know a mid to high two handle per share on a gap basis. Mark, you, that's terrific. You've been very eloquent on this as well. You, Mark's Twitter feed is a must follow for everyone. You laid this all out. A lot of your own work, a lot of good stuff from uh, some others as well. And just to remind people, Mark, that that if they, if they and I, has a sub two dollar number as well but mark just just for reference sake even if we even adam jonas who counts himself i think we all count him as yes two leaders he's got what a three dollar kind of a number in well store. he's got low threes but he said in his in his text that he could see tesla earnings quote unquote bottoming out at around three dollars this year let me say one other thing by the way um about my quote unquote methodology. Look, this is all back of the envelope stuff, but I think that's really all you need for this business. Um, I didn't assume that the full price cut comes out of each car. I added back in a thousand dollars of of profit above and beyond, you know, what the price cut will cost them. And as Motorhead pointed out, uh, that could be like extremely generous if their costs uh, of of inputs keep going up, you know? And the, and the other thing I want to point out is because Tesla bulls are like, oh, we have these two, uh, you know, factories that are barely utilized and, you know, and so, you know, um, fixed costs per car are going to come way down. Here's what I can't understand. If you look at Tesla DNA, uh, depreciation amortization, on the statement for, for Q4 that they just reported versus Q4 of the year ago of 2021, it was only up around 16%, which was a hundred and something million dollar increase, despite the fact that they opened these two brand new big factories in the year that followed 2021. In other words, Q4 of 21, there was presumably no depreciation of Texas and, um, and, and the German factory because they weren't open. They were still under construction. How do you open, how do you double your production capacity Plus, you know, two, twice as many factories, plus undoubtedly they added like a bunch of superchargers and service facilities and whatever else, and yet only have DNA go up by 16% year over year. What I'm getting at is I have a really strong feeling that they've only been uh, ramping, I hate that word, but let's use it, the, the, the depreciation of these new factories sort of calibrated step by step as they increase production. If that's the case, what it means is there won't be particularly great fixed cost uh, gains and margins because the, the depreciation from these factories will increase each time they you know, build an extra car over what they built previously. So I don't think there are gonna be such great fixed cost gains you know, if they build, oh, one other thing, okay? Um, Q4 production, was just under 440,000 cars, okay? It was a, it's an annualized run rate of 1.75 million, okay? They're guiding to, to, to full year production this year of only 1.8 million, okay? So, I mean, what is that? Like producing 5% more cars or something like that? So how do you think there's gonna be any great fixed cost gains by only increasing production like 5% <laughs> You know, over the Q4 run rate, and by the way, probably having to um, depreciate more of your new factories. Everybody follow that? Yeah, M Mark, just so you know, I, I've been uh, taking liberty of posting some of the tweets that you're um, re referencing, particularly the one on the, on the DNA, which is really interesting math. That's up in the nest, um, as well as um, the volume numbers. Mark, maybe you could just highlight for people. I put it up uh, in the nest. Uh, you uh, put this, re retweeted this thing from uh, JC where um, the, because yeah, it, about how uh, consensus expectations had changed. So uh, I'm just, I just retweeted, put it up on the nest. He points out, you, you retweeted it, that going into, in, going into um, 3Q, 
the consensus delivery was a million nine forty nine, and now it's a million eight. So not only do you have down uh, expected gro- uh, operating gross margins, you have a reduction in expected growth as well. And I think to be fair to Musk, yeah, they could probably sell more cars, but the, always the question is at what price. Um, another question I'd like to ask you, Mark, um, something you retweeted from Jim in Motorhead. I want to come on to you in a second. Um, this was something from Jim from uh, talking about Tesla's recognition of um, FSD, <laughs> despite how many years after they first promised it. Like, didn't they recognize a fair bit of FSD revenue in the fourth quarter, Mark? Yeah, they. Well, as I said, they recognized over three hundred million. The reason I gave them credit for that in my, in other words, I didn't deduct it from from let's say and try to normalize the earnings deduct it is because I think I I don't know if I read it or heard it that they had a a currency loss of about three hundred million. So you know that's also an extraordinary item. So I'll let them I'll let those two neutralize each other. But yeah, I mean to your point, um, supposedly they finagled some nonsense of of, you know, splitting up the capabilities of the system so that they can, you know, claim that they earned, you know, more and more of it. I don't know. It doesn't, it's almost irrelevant to me because the thing is bullshit. It can never work safely without LIDAR. Um, Musk p- talks out of both sides of his mouth. Somebody put a funny tweet up there that, you know, on the earnings call, he said, no one is even close to us in autonomy. You can't even see anyone else with a telescope, you know, despite the fact that, of course, um, you know, Cruz and Waymo in multiple cities are running fully autonomous taxis as well as as well as companies in China. And Mercedes just got uh, permission to um, to to run its um, its cars to, to use uh, level three autonomy, which ba- which means hands free, eyes free. You can text, you know, you can play with yourself. You can do whatever you want while the car drives you on. In this case, uh, so initially restricted to limited access highways up to 40 miles an hour, but that's when you'd want it because, you know, it drives you crazy. You're sitting there and stop and go traffic on, on the I-10 or wherever the hell you commute, you know, the, you know, cross Bronx expressway and your car drives for you and, and you do whatever the hell you want. So Tesla's nowhere near that, right? They don't have LIDAR. They're not going to get there. Anyway, the point is, <laughs> so you know, on the, on the earnings call, Musk says, you know, no one's close. You can't see us with a telescope. And then, and then this guy pointed out on Twitter that, of course, when they haul him into court for this, he'll say, well, we always told people this was only a level two system and you, you know, and, and you have to be responsible at all times. Whatever. He talks out of both sides of his mouth. It's a huge liability. Uh, look, there's a really good chance. So as we're on this topic real quick, there's a really good chance, finally, that the NASD forces a recall of this thing. And um, the reason I say that is. They 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 got I'm, I'm sorry, NH, not NASD, uh, NHTSA. They, they got uh, NHTSA. They got the head of NHTSA, Reuters did, in, in an aside, in an interview like two weeks ago. And she said, look, and they asked her and she said, we're moving as fast as we can on this. We still have to, you know, to do a little bit more research on 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 the legal side because it's a bit of a novel case. And and, you know, we're fin- finalizing our engineering study or whatever. Point is, when you talk, start talking about a novel case on the legal side, and that's exactly what she said or close to what she said, what she's really saying is we're going to sue these fucks to get this off the road because they refuse to do it. And we want to have all our legal ducks in a row. So and she said, we're moving as fast as we can and we're moving very fast on it. I think NHTSA is going to sue Tesla to force a recall of this thing. And I think it's going to happen you know, maybe this quarter, you know, maybe February or March. I mean, the way she said it, you can find the story and I tweeted it. And that's a multi-billion dollar liability. And that's just on the, that's just on what, that's just what, what, what people paid for this thing. If someone sues them and says, hey, I bought my whole $70,000 car because you promised me it would drive itself. Well, I believe it was in Germany that one or two cases were won on that premise, not just the cost of the, of the of the FSD software, but the cost of the whole car, and Tesla had to refund that cost. If that starts catching fire here, uh, no pun intended, um, it's going to be a, a you know, a, it's going to bankrupt the company if that were to happen. All right, go ahead. Sorry, that's fantastic. Yep. So let's go over to Motorhead. So Motorhead, there's a lot to unpack there. 
Um, and Mark, please stay with us as long as you can. So Motorhead, I want to go back. I, I want to keep in some type of order. Um, so I, broadly, cons- I believe your earnings outlook is broadly consistent with Mark's. Um, I'll uh, put back up on the nest what you just wrote. Maybe let's just start with the with the facts and numbers. Just walk through in your mind what's your sort of min max probable for earnings estimates for uh, Tesla in 23. And also just note to self, note to everybody in the room, when we talk about a three dollar or two dollar number for uh for 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 23 um i think the number for 22 was 396 or something like that so we're talking about down earnings um so anyway so let's first start motorhead what's uh, let's get let's cut to the chase and get to where what's your best guess as to where you think earnings come out in 23 for tesla well i mean uh from the from the tweet in the nest um i've got a dollar 69 in gap eps $2.02 Two dollars and two cents on 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 non gap, and uh, basically what Mark was just talking about when you ramp up these two factories, the reason the depreciation hasn't showed up um, yet is because um, they do it. If you look at their um, ten Qs, um, or or maybe it's just in the ten K, they they depreciate new factory equipment on a per unit basis. So they only used 15% of their combined capacity in both in both of those new factories. So that's going to get the more they ramp those those factories up, depreciation will spike. So I've got fixed fixed um, costs at the uh, Cogs level going up 33% year on year, and that's um, 18% increase for labor. They need to hire more workers, um, especially in Germany. And that's uh, 54% for depreciation alone. So, um, and that's manufacturing de- depreciation. That doesn't include all the lease stuff and whatnot. But um, so I get gross margins going from um, from uh, last year's full year result of around 28.5%. Uh, I see that going down to 17.4% in 2023. And that's mainly just being modeled by the reduction in prices. By the way, I think they have to cut prices again sometime this year. Um, the current prices are still too high, especially in, in, in the U.S. And, and hey, Motorhead, I have a yeah. question. I have a question. Sure. Gross margin in Q4 was, including everything, giving them any benefit, including FSD bullshit, was what, 23 or 24 percent? What was the number? Um, for if you, you want to include like uh, you want to include like so. Auto gross margins versus uh, X Zev credits was twenty. No, include credits because let's assume they get some new kind of credits this year. Let's just be generous. What was the number? Uh, uh, it was um, um, c- combined. It was uh, like t- uh, automotive gross profit, including everything, was twenty twenty five point nine percent in the in oh. Q four. Okay, let's say it was. I thought it was lower, but let's say it was twenty five. If you that cut includes- prices, if you cut prices by twelve percent, which they did versus Q four, I believe that's that's the cut. Why wouldn't it go from 25 to, you know, to, um, to, to, to 13, ass- assuming that, that uh, DNA ramps in line with, with increased production? And by the way, as I said earlier, production is going to be barely any more than the Q4 run rate of, of 440,000. And, and, you know, and, and that's not even accounting for, as you pointed out, probably higher costs on all the raw materials why wouldn't that price cut just come right out of gross margin and cut it from 25 to, um, you know, to, to, to 13? Um, yeah, I, 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 it could, but I, I think they need further price cuts. Also, by the way, if you have but, to but look- you said 17. But so that's uh, that's why I'm asking. I'm saying, why are you being that generous when in Q4 yeah. it was 25 and they're cutting the price by 12 percent? That's 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 what the model spits out. What yeah, model? Yeah, mo- 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 yeah, mo- motorhead, motorhead. Why? I, I, you, you're not. <laughs> you're, you're you're the resident bear with a low number anyway. But I guess what Mark's getting at, this isn't a friendly friendly conversation. Why ceteris paribus? If we're at twenty five, to simple math, and we take away twelve, why don't we get thirteen? Well, we could, but I'm 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 uh, I've set up my model to include I- Tesla accounting practices. All right, to include well, let, what? Let, 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 let me put the question another way. Mark, I, I want to be Switzerland on this one. Motorhead, given the degree of conservatism or generosity that you put in your numbers, as you sit here right now, do you think you're being you, you think 2023 is gross margins likely to come in higher or lower than you're assuming? I mean, you already given them a pretty nice cushion. You, 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 you know, obviously the future's unknowable, but 
I guess what Mark's trying to get at is it seems you're being really nice or generous in your model. Is that is that fair, Mark? Yeah. I, well, but one issue is I, I don't I don't I mean he's using a a full year uh, model of tw or full year numbers for 2022. I, I mean, why even do that? Just use just use Q4. I mean, Q4 production was pretty much the same as it's going to be. Uh, on a run rate basis for all of 2023. So why not just start with the Q4 numbers and work from there? There was nothing extraordinary in yeah, Q4. Yeah, Mark, you know what's, really, what's really funny about this conversation right now, this line of thought is, I mean, we're all friends here. We're kind of, you're taking Moda to task for being too nice. No, I don't mean to no. take him to task. I'm asking him, maybe no, I'm no, missing no, no. something. I, I, yeah. Poor choice of words on my part. You, you're, you've got a guy who's got a number that's even lower than yours. And if he puts in that number, it's going to go even lower. Um and so, I mean, by the way, so apropos of that, apropos of that, and Mark and Moderator, please don't laugh too hard, but I have to ask the question. One of the, one of the things they put in the, in, the, in the conference call was, oh, well, you know, our margins were depressed in the fourth quarter because, among other things, we were delivering out a lot of the lower margin uh, orders that, that we've been deferring. I mean, I, I kind of totally discount that. Do you think there's any shred of... Uh, well, but he of, said, but, but he said the ASP would be, quote, over 47,000. And over 47,000 uh, in Tesla talk means like, you know, 47,000 and a penny, right? <laughs> so, so basically, I believe that's around a $6,000. Uh, I mean, he said that that's what it would be this year. I believe that's around a $6,000 uh, cut versus the Q4 ASP, something like that, right? That's how I'm coming up with like a 12% average price cut. So... I mean, Q4 to me is a great quarter to use. We're being very generous to them in terms of credits. And, 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 and you know, let's say that the currency uh, loss is, is neutralized by the bullshit FSD thing. So that becomes a non-issue. And so that's what I'm using. And you use that number. They're barely growing production this year. So where's the economy of scale, even if they could get one? You know, it's just like not going to happen unless I'm missing something. Well, then what do you get for full year EPS? Well, um, I, I, I forget the number I came up with. I think it was around, okay, I, I think it was around, call it $2.50 a share gap. Okay, so uh, I, I'm, I'm still, you know, I'm still doing, uh, tightening up my model, but I get a dollar, you know, 60, uh, 69 or something. So that, that's in, in gap EPS. Yeah, so. I was using gap too. Wow, okay, so you're a lot lower, even assuming... Uh, a higher margin. But, you know, just putting all that aside, because you keep going, your model, your model, model. Why not use Q4 as your benchmark and then work off of that with the price cut? Isn't that the easiest way to do it? And that's still generous to Tesla because you got 600 and something million of credit revenue. And again, let's not let's leave the FSD out because they supposedly had the currency loss. So let's just pretend that neither of those happened. And so it's pretty generous. Why not just use Q4? And they told you flat out, they're only increasing production by something like 5% this year over Q4's annualized production. So why not just work with Q4 instead of the whole year of 2022? Well, I, 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 I think it's a very fair question. And I just want to point out to everybody what strikes me. Notice what we're debating here is the bid ass spread is like you know a buck sixty three bucks, okay? Which is like which is like which is like in a different area code from the street. So let's not lose sight of that one. Well, let by the, the way, it's that, here, let me George, let me just point something out. It's actually not in a different exact. Well, okay, dollar sixty is a different area code. Three bucks is not a different area code. You know, from Adam Jonas and and you know. And there's a three handle. A number of guys, I think, actually have a three handle now uh, for this year. And and so, yeah, all right, yes, that's a different area code from a dollar sixty. But the real question is, when is the last time a quote unquote growth stock, you know, could have a a thirty percent margin decline, and or twenty five percent if you want to be generous? I think it's going to be over thirty percent as this as this Motorhead, and still was allowed a multiple. Of um of sixty or seventy or whatever you know sixty, a hundred percent. Especially keeping in mind that it's a Chinese automaker. So let me do it this way. <laughs> let's go, Motorhead. Let's go back to you, Motorhead. Yeah. If I if I say to you, min max probable because you know we're throwing numbers around as single point estimates. You know, the futures making predictions about the future is difficult, as we all know. But if I said to you, min max probable, Motorhead, on your on your range, what could you reasonably see min max probable for earnings in twenty twenty three for Tesla? What would you say? 
Uh, what do you mean by mid max? Sorry. Well, you know, you 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 throw you throw you you make your you sort of mid, best guess is a buck seventy, whatever the number is. Okay, how you know on a bad day, how bad could you see it going? If assuming a dollar seventy is the wrong number, let's say it's a lot worse than you expect, a lot better than you expected. What could you see in terms of the extremes, both better than expected and worse than expected relative to your relative to your expectations? I, I think I think they could uh, generate a, a full blown net loss in in twenty twenty three. I mean, the, when when these big automakers, you know, um, you know, see a collapse in, in prices and stuff like that, I mean, you, you blow a hole in your balance sheet. And that's that's uh, perfectly possible this year. And what do you see for potential upside motor? Let's say you're being too too stingy. Well, um, I don't know if you guys um, listened to the uh, to the detail that um, the CFO gave, but um, he actually they they had a question, which I'm sure he you know, they read beforehand. It was from Say. It wasn't from from the analysts. Um, and uh, and he he put out this number. It's very interesting. So one point they they assume one point eight billion in in, in um, deliveries, and um, they they they're saying that prices will be over forty seven thousand, and they said that uh, you know the uh, gross profit margin with excluding lease and Zev credits would be twenty over twenty percent. Um, that gives you a thirty nine percent increase in pure automotive gross profits year on year. So I don't know what they're smoking over there, but it's it's they're absolutely insane. Hey, Mark, let me ask you the same question. Getting away from single point guesstimates, look, how bad could you see it getting? How good could you see it getting? The, the absolute best I can see gap earnings for this year, the best is 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 three dollars a share, you know. Um, the, the worst I would see it would be, I, let me think for a second. Um, well, let's say, let's say, um, uh, let me think, uh, 2000, uh, 3.6 million. The, the worst I could see it would be like, um, I don't know, call it a dollar fifty gap. I don't see them losing money. Uh, well, let me back up. I could see them losing money if they cut prices again, but let's assume pricing doesn't get any lower than what it is now. Then I see worst case a dollar fifty, you know, gap. Best case three dollars. You know, my probable case. I think I I think I posted two forty, but you know, who knows? There's room in there. Two fifty doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. With with the multiple it should have, which is probably about a six. You know, we're arguing should the you know should the stock be nine dollars a share or eighteen dollars a share? Well. Right now, it's $180 a share. So, you know, when we, when we get closer, I'll worry about the nuances, you know? That's fine. That's fine. All right. Let, let's shift gears just a touch. I want to go back to Motorhead. Motorhead, um, can we talk a little bit about Musk's comments about how their orders are running twice deliveries? And I think it was it never had such a strong month in orders. And we know that he par- he's a master of parsing things. Um, there was a, you know, orders, I think, went to zero at the end of the end of the year for a couple reasons, you know, most notably China, et cetera, et cetera. So how much of that is, is he telling the whole story or is that just a, a one-off thing? Is he exaggerating? Is he putting it out of context first for Motorhead and, 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 and then to Mark? What's happening to well, orders, Motorhead? Yeah, well, I mean, if you cut prices, but by the way, the, the, the price cuts were 15% on average on a weighted volume average. Remember that the price cut on the, on the Model Y is, is, is um, 20%. And that 66% of their volumes last year was Model Y. So um, you cut the prices by 20% on your key model. Um, you're going to get some order flow. But um, given how high uh, their inventories were at the end of Q4, of course, order flow is going to be twice production if, because they're definitely idling production at this point if they've got too much inventory. So, of course, it's a no-brainer that orders can be um, twice as high as production or whatever. Let me let me interrupt for one second, Motorhead, just to point out and reiterate your point. Okay, as we all know, Musk is a fucking wise guy. Okay, <laughs> w- when Musk says that orders are twice production, he could have been referring literally to to that hour of orders coming into the company. And I'm not being facetious. I mean, that's the kind of wise guy he is. Like, if for whatever reason between four and five p.m. that day, because they got all this in real time. You know, they had whatever, 2000 orders and and they only made a thousand cars. I mean, it's a nonsensical statistic. Sorry for interrupting. Go ahead. Exactly. And believe me, uh, the, the, it's it's only it was only like less than three weeks since they lowered prices. So, 
I, 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 I thought that was a ridiculous statement that, and, and it probably got retail all, all, all hyped up and that's why the stock ramped up in the after hours. But, um, I, I think that, um, the, the biggest, the, the biggest sort of threat to these guys is how are they going to, uh, handle their Shanghai factory? I mean, that thing produced, you know, like I said, uh, 92% of 2021's profits, they're going to have to idle production there this year because, um, uh, 40% of production in China was exported, and most of that was exported to Europe. And they can't, they can't do that this year because they, if they do, they have to. They can't ramp up Berlin fast enough. So you've got some horrible stuff happening in China, and demand there. I mean, the price, the price cuts there. It's interesting because China publishes weekly um, insured units. Um, you've you've got if the first price cut when they when sales went down dramatically and they implemented a, a something like a, a, I think like a $7,000 price cut in October 24th, the, the sales spiked for about, for about like six, seven weeks. And then they started to come down again. And then they implemented another price cut in December. So th this is a sugar high type thing. Unless you bring out new products, um, they're not going to be able to, uh, to raise their volumes is, is my, my point of view. Right. So, uh, Mark, for you first and then Motorhead. So we're, we're coalescing around this view that, you know, Tesla earnings will be down this year. Two bucks, three bucks. Who knows? Could be more, could be less. But they're going to have down earnings. Mark, do you think, uh, I mean, this is a straight question because I don't know what to believe anymore. Do you think that the um, the buy side really understands that or do you think? <laughs> There's a lot of retail guys are taking what Musk says literally at face value. In other words, let's say they only make two dollars or two and a half dollars or three dollars. Um, will that be enough to make the stock go down, or are there still further, you know, aspirations, dreams about mega packs and God knows what else? Um, you know, I guess what it gets to does, does the market believe this? Does the market understand this number, and what is it going to take for the stock to go down? In your view, Mark? Well, that, you're asking a great question. So, yes, a couple of questions. First of all, you asked about sell side analysts. So obviously, Gordon Johnson understands this stuff. Um, I think uh, Ryan Brinkman understands this stuff. He's the guy at J.P. Morgan. Um, but, you know, for whatever reason, they, he still has an, an unrealistically high price target. I think it's 120 or something, even though he's got to sell on the stock. Um, I think that um, what's his name? Um, Tony. Uh, oh, Tony, Eddie, a person, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think he probably understands. I mean, those guys still have three-digit price targets, which is nuts. But, but, and I've never met either of them in, in person or even spoke to either of them on the phone. So to be clear, I, I don't know that this is true, but I, my guess is maybe if I sat down and had a beer with them, they'd say, look, you know, we'd be laughed at if we set the target at $30. So here's where we are and we'll follow it down. But th that's my words, not theirs, to be, to be perfectly clear. The rest of this sell side, Adam Jonas... I think totally understands. I think he's a scumbag because Morgan Stanley wants to do the, all the banking business with Musk. They've lent him a lot of money. Now they're in the hole with him for the Twitter loans, you know, and, and, they, and they don't want to have to put in margin calls. So I think Jonas is smart enough to understand he's just a scumbag. Um, you know, Dan Ives is a, is a convi you know, admitted scumbag with the SEC fraud admission. I, I think he may know or he may just be a fucking idiot. And the other guys, I I've never met any of them. I don't know if they're morons or if, or if they're just scumbags. So I think that answers that question. What was the second question? Oh, yeah, 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 the market. So, so here's the thing. I don't know. Uh, part of me says I don't know if there's anyone who still owns Tesla, I mean, for, for any period of time, who even understands what a financial statement is or cares, right, that isn't you know, in the cult. And, and it's funny, I did a podcast yesterday with Hugh Hendry and he, he criticized me for using the phrase cult, but you know, sorry, Hugh, that's what it is. It's, you know, when, when you have that Chinese guy, or he's actually lives in Singapore, he's American, Chinese American software billionaire, who at one point said, you know, I'll hold my Tesla till I die. There's nothing that would get me to sell it. And he was saying that even when he wanted them to, to get rid of Musk, that's a cult. Okay. That's, that's not an investment. So I don't know if these matter, numbers matter to the cult or not, but the, the counter argument to that is, hey, the stock did go from $400 to $100, right? And the reason for that was somebody out there understood what was going on. So the question is, if, yeah, if this month was just, 
you know, a bear market fierce rally akin to January of 2001 um, and, and that reverses and the bear trend continues, I don't think there's any way this crazy option gamma is still going to be there driving the stock up. And in fact, there's a really good chance that it just reverses and starts driving it down, which it did on several occasions, uh, you know, in 2022. So in that case, I, I, I think on the I, there are cult members who will never sell this uh, no matter what. And then there are the players, these option players who will go either way on it and drive it down as fast as they'll drive it up. The handful of, of fundamental investors that are still here on the margin, and there are some, I assume. I mean, I was being a little bit facetious. Um, yes, I think it will matter to those guys, and I think they'll give up the ghost this year. Mark, you know what? I'm, I'm thinking about this whole gamma squeeze that's been going on ferociously. Is um, It coincides with Twitter having to pay their first uh, interest payment on those um, high yield. Uh, uh, on... <laughs> well, I'm not, if you're raising I'm not that, joking. if you're raising that as an issue, but I hear you. If you're look, if you're raising that as an issue, then um, someone please explain what the mysterious new four billion dollar investment on Tesla's balance sheet is. <laughs> right? I guess maybe we'll learn when the 10K comes out, maybe Monday morning. But people were joking on Twitter, but. Does anyone really believe that Musk wouldn't take four billion of Tesla's cash and use it to bridge the what he needed to buy Twitter? <laughs> actually, actually, Mark, I think that's um, it's some kind of um, fixed return investment. Lucid did the same thing in in the second quarter and the third quarter. Oh, okay, fine. I, I mean, so, yeah, I, I didn't really think that's what it was. But, well, what do you think the relation is to the to the payment? You think Musk has to dump more stock to make the interest payment? I, I totally, I totally believe that, and it, it, there's talk about him trying to buy that three billion dollar bond out, so they don't have to pay that interest. Yeah, I'll say this: nothing's impossible, obviously, with this guy. It would be really, really hilarious if, um, if the 10K dropped Monday morning or Tuesday, whatever, and that day or the next day, you know, he dumped another three billion or whatever. I think the, mo the interest payment's only a few hundred million, but yeah, if you wanted to buy the debt. He dumped another three billion of Tesla stock literally, you know, two and a half weeks after swearing he wouldn't be selling any until what? At least 2024 or 2025. It would be he, hilarious. He swore on April 28th last year that he wouldn't sell any more stock. And he sold. Them right. I know. But then he but he did it again two and a half weeks ago. So, yeah, it's kind of funny to see how many times he can keep lying to the moron cult members without them. You know, but but that said, many of these moron cult members, when the stock was taking a dive, they were ready to ditch Musk, but they still weren't ready to ditch Tesla, you know? So. Right. right. Hey, hey, Mark and Motorhead, speaking, speaking of Twitter, <coughs> excuse me, do you have any, I, I don't want to go on fishing expeditions, but aside from this, the debt that's out there on uh, Twitter already, do you have any sense of what's going on with uh, Twitter's... Um, cash flow and losses, all the stories about, you know, number of advertisers uh, that have uh, dropped. And a lot of the, a lot of the headcount went down. Some of that was people walking out. Some of that was him firing guys. But aside from just the debt that he took out to buy Twitter, you, Mark first and Motorhead, do you have any sense of what extent Twitter could be an ongoing uh, cash drain for Musk? I asked the question only because in turn that might uh, pressure him to sell yet more stock. Well, I, look, I only know what I've read, you know, from the information and, and various other websites, I guess Dow Jones had some stuff, but I mean, it's, it's pretty clear that it's even with all his cuts uh, on the, on the expense side that it's burning at least a billion a year now I, and maybe more, right. I think Musk said at one point it was like, um, um, uh, no, nah, I think about a billion, maybe 2 billion, whatever. I don't know what the context is of that to, to how much cash Musk has on hand at this point. I don't know what the context is to, uh, to, you know, if Musk had to sell all else equal and everything else aside, if Musk just had to sell a billion a year of Tesla to finance, um, uh, you know, to finance Twitter, I, I think that's a non-issue for the stock. Um, so I, I don't think that's a big deal. I do think it's amazing that uh, <laughs> that this guy managed to completely fucking destroy a company other than other than I mean, I do appreciate the more open dialogue and and, you know, the the uncancellation of at least of most of the accounts. I do like that he did that. I mean, to be fair to the guy, but, and, and look, he hasn't even blocked me yet, which is, I guess he just doesn't care. He probably doesn't know who I am anymore. But, um, 
<laughs> but I just, just think it's amazing how quickly he was able, from a business perspective, to completely destroy a company. It's like, it's almost a miracle. Like, you know, I couldn't, I don't think I could do that if I tried doing that. And I'm, I'm not much of a business guy, you know, Mark, yeah, Mark I don't want to go down too much of a Twitter hole. Go to Motorhead yeah. for a second. But one other question before we go to Motorhead, um, any thoughts on SpaceX? I know they did a, a financing round. It was a relatively small amount of money. It's some insane valuation. Any thoughts about, about, about SpaceX and, 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 and how they're doing and the valuation of that company and how it plays into Musk's finances? Well, the last round valuation of SpaceX was was some absurdly higher number, probably the same investors putting in a little bit so they wouldn't have to mark it down. But SpaceX is odd. I mean, they keep having to raise money, right? Everyone says, oh, SpaceX, it's a miracle. No, SpaceX is basically selling products at below cost. So, I mean, I guess engineering wise, it's it's amazing and it looks cool to see the rockets land. But it's a really shitty business. Like, actually, like pretty much any Musk business, I think. <laughs> but, is it, 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 Mark, you follow it more closely than I do, but is it something like on 30 or 40 times sales, some crazy number like that? I, I don't, you know, their financials aren't public. So all we can know is that on, on the one hand, they keep having to raise money, right? And, and, but on the other hand, it's obvious on the back of an envelope that Starlink is a massive money sink because, you know, without getting in the weeds, the satellites only last supposedly like five years. And if you can if you can somehow miraculously get enough density to make a satellite profitable, which is unlikely because the places people need a, a satellite are incredibly undense. Right. And so there's either not enough people or not enough income to pay for this service. You know, so. Um, it, the satellites quickly load up. The bandwidth drags like crazy, and there's all kinds of stories about that. And oh, now you got to put up another satellite. You know, it's just like it's a complete loser. Other than maybe you know what the Department of Defense is willing to give them to subsidize it. But what I read, that's a relatively small amount of money. So I just think it's an, another massive money sink. That's probably why they're losing so much money. I mean, the launches. Maybe at this point the launches break even. I don't know. Maybe they make a little money, but. So then it's a shitty business that breaks even. But with Starlink, I think it's a it's a cash gusher and it always will be. I don't think Starlink will ever be profitable. Motorhead, over to you. I, we, there's a lot to unpack there. Any any uh, I know you don't count yourself as a Twitter expert or as a, as a space heads expert, but any of that, uh, any any comments on any of that? Yes, yeah, so I I I I, t I I know nothing about SpaceX. Um, I just I just agree with Mark. I I, I just know investors who have um who have been approached to to look at the uh, at, at investing, and um, apparently uh, no numbers are provided whatsoever. <laughs> so um, then when it comes to Twitter, I actually modeled out Twitter using all all the data that was available, and um, the first half of last year before they became delisted. Uh, delisted. And um, so, I mean, sales are probably down around 49% this year um, versus last year. And I, I assume that, you know, uh, each, each of the 7,500 staffers that they fired, you know, had an annual income of like $200,000, could be more. Um, and so I stripped that out of SG&A. Anyways, I get them losing about $3.4 billion this year. And um, cash burn is probably $2.9 billion. So um, this is this is going to be a cash incinerator that that Musk has to do something about. Wow. All right. Let's go to a few questions. I see um, we have uh, Vishnu uh, up on stage. Vishnu, welcome. Uh, the floor is yours. You have a question? Uh, hi. Thanks for letting me speak. Um, so I just want to weigh in on FSD. And I, I heard like um, uh, people say uh, Ben's le released a level three and uh Tesla is nowhere near level three, and uh, companies like Benz were able to come uh, release level three because they have uh, lidar. But uh, lidar is just a sensor, and uh, just because you have lidar on a, a car doesn't make it any safer, or doesn't make doesn't mean not you true. Have... Not true. You need the redundancy. Okay, cameras plus <clears throat> radar plus lidar give you redundancy. Lidar catches things that cameras alone miss. Radar catches things that cameras alone miss. Cameras catch things that LIDAR or radar might miss. 
you need triple redundancy. Read an interview with the guy who runs Mobileye, and he'll tell you. He'll explain the same thing to you. And he had a camera only system. Yeah, well, uh, the thing is, like, you still have, uh, you don't have any redundancy on a uh, number of steering wheels you have, number of uh, brake pedals you have, you don't have redundancy on number of brakes you have. Uh, you you just have four four wheels, and if one wheel is gone, the car is gone. So, like, I, the, the redundancy is uh, by, just for safety is good, but then, like, I think it 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 should be data driven. Uh, and Tesla. Is I'm sorry. What do you mean? What do you mean data driven? Uh, probably with the number of, uh, 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 what do you call, uh, cameras you have, it is still possible to achieve a level of safety. Really? Uh, so how, how do you do in the fog? Fog, you think, you think, uh, LiDAR works in a fog? Radar. Well, uh, I, I think like, uh, this, uh, they, they are coming in with a high definition la- ra- radar though. But then, Who is? Uh, uh, Tesla. Well, right now, there's no radar on any of those unguided missiles uh, that have been built in the last, what, three years, and they're all cruising around, and he's calling it full yeah. self-driving, all right? Yeah. So you want to talk about high-definition radar on a Tesla? Let's talk after it's on there, and then we'll see if that's good enough without the LiDAR, which, by the way, the experts tell me it isn't. Okay, so, so now, it's, it's not, yeah. I'm not talking about the binary thing. It's not, I'm not talking about the robo, robo taxi uh, quality of, like, FSD. Now I'm talking about uh, comparison between what uh, BMW comes up with and calls it level 3 and what uh, Tesla has. And, yeah, there are certain condi- uh, weather conditions like fog, extreme snow, that, like, even, like, crews or Waymo cannot, uh, cannot deal with it uh, at this point. Uh, well, so it's not like we don't have to actually cover hundred percent of the cases. Like let's let's talk about like majority of the cases, uh, and also Wait, if you don't cover a hundred percent of the cases, you don't have full self driving, pal. I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. And obviously, this is a rhetorical thing I'm about to say. Yeah. Take take a Waymo car or a cruise car and stick it anywhere in the world because I know the Tesla lemmings are like, oh well, they're using. It's, it's geo-restricted, so it's really only level four. Stick it anywhere in the world next to a Tesla off the assembly line and set them both off on a 20-mile trip and see which one makes it and which one crashes. And I don't mean 20 miles on a limited-access highway with no exits. I mean put them in a city, any strange city in the world. Which one do you think is going to make it or is going to make it with fewer interventions? I'm pretty sure Waymo and uh, Cruise cannot make it in any random city. They have like, not made, true. They, not <clears throat> true. The high def spend, maps aid everything else that they have. It's not just about the maps. It's like okay, so if the height of maps doesn't take uh, a, a day or two actually to build for a city like San Francisco, but still, Cruise, Cruise from 2013 or 14, they have been concentrating on making it work in San Francisco. And still, they are not. Uh, they, their uh, cars doesn't work well in San Francisco. Look, okay, uh, num- you know, All the right. number of times it's actually blocking the streets. Uh, oh, the number of accidents it caused. Well, I've seen it. First of all, they they haven't caused accidents, but yes, every once in a while they do block the street. So fine, let's take a Tesla off the assembly line, and let's take a cruise and set them both in San Francisco to go from you know the Golden Gate Bridge to to downtown. Let's see which one makes it and which one crashes. Okay, so there have been a uh, lot of uh, videos posted on uh, uh, Twitter uh, that is actually making so many of the uh, uh, drives within San Francisco uh, without any disengagements and crashes. Yeah, I- I'll believe it. I'll believe it w- uh, when I see it. I mean, they are okay. constantly disengaging. Oh, yeah. Well, okay. So in that case, like, I, I, why don't you actually like uh, uh, wherever you are, <clears throat> uh, uh, take a take a Tesla car with an FST and, and, and try it out. Like, and like, I don't want to die. Well, it's not, well, if, if anyone has actually taught a teenager how to drive and you can, you can safely drive a Tesla FST. It's, 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 it's okay, not like- fine. Listen, every expert in the world in autonomy, and some of them may even be Tesla stockholders will tell you that the Tesla system is unsafe and it will never be safe without redundancy in the sensors, okay? And you can go on YouTube and see all the videos from the FSD beta testers and they're like, whoa, I almost went into that tractor trailer. Whoa, I ran the red light. Whoa, I ran the stop sign. It is a dangerous, dangerous system. I don't, you know, I, I don't know what else to tell you. 
every expert, you are not, I, I don't know what you do, but if you think you know what you're talking about, I, I don't pretend that I know what I'm talking about beyond what I've read from every autonomy expert in the world, okay? And they're not out to get Elon Musk, they're out to so, see safety on the roads. All right, so let's, so let, I, I think we've gone down this rabbit hole enough. <laughs> Thank you for the question, Vesh, you made your position clear. Mark, you made your position clear. Let's move on. I want to go to uh, Zach Howard and then Mount Cox. Good to see you, Zach. What's up? Hey, George, thanks. Uh, Mark, my question's on this uh, SEC investigation in the mosque yesterday with the FSD. Is that the equivalent of a Wells notice? And what's preventing them, if it is, uh, from doing a secondary here? Well, I don't think it's a Wells notice until it's a Wells notice, right? It, it seems to be a, a, what they would call a preliminary investigation. I assume, and I'm not a securities lawyer, that as long as Tesla you know, puts in the prospectus, hey, the SEC is investigating us for, you know, the way we've marketed uh, full self-driving. As long as they disclose it, I assume they could raise money. I mean, if that's your issue. I mean, they disclose all kinds of other shit. Look at their, <laughs> look at their 10Q. There's like, there's like half a page about this agency and that agency and the other agency. I, I do think what may be more interesting, look, we know that the SEC has been completely toothless with Musk. I mean, it's a joke. I mean, I talked about this yesterday on Twitter, but you know, in April of last year, so what, it's almost a full year ago, M Musk filed a fraudulent 13G be uh, for Twitter. It should have been a D because it turned out he had been talking about a board seat for weeks before he filed it. And it was 11 days late. OK, this is not a gray area. This is like, oh, we, we don't know if we can prove it in court. This is black and white. As far as I know, as far as it's public, the SEC has not done shit about it. Right. How long would it take to bring an enforcement action against that? So as far, I mean, all you need to know, and I tweeted about this too, is this story broke, okay? This endangers, this theoretically would endanger both, both Musk's, you know, freedom, if it becomes a criminal case, certainly would endanger his ability to, to remain as an officer with Tesla, and it endangers, like, one of the major reasons that Tesla has this insane premium price, which is the delusion of, 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 of automotive autonomy, and the stock, when the story hit, the stock went from up 12% to up 11.5%, right? And I think it closed up 11%. That tells you that the market thinks that the SEC is a complete and total toothless entity when it comes to Elon Musk. The, the one thing that may be more meaningful is people don't remember, but in October, a story came out that the, that the DOJ was looking into this full self-driving thing. And the DOJ has, has not necessarily been toothless, but we'll see. Does that answer your question? That's yeah, great. and I guess it, I guess it opens up another question: the DOJ, SEC, NHTSA, whatever. Are they, <laughs> are they all fighting amongst each other to try to who's who's leading the charge here? I, I doubt it. I think they're all I think they're all fighting among each other to see who can retreat faster. <laughs> right. Hey, Mark, 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 Mark let's up, Mark, Motorhead. You want to weigh in on any of this uh, potential regulation from, from the Alphabet Soup agencies? Do you have any perspectives, Motorhead? I think I think the uh, the autopilot FSD uh, investigation by NHTSA is is coming to a head, just like Mark uh, mentioned earlier. Um, they are in, you know, they're at the engineering level of the inspection, which is the final stage. And there's some very interesting stuff that has gone on at uh, at NHTSA. They had for the first time, you know, since Trump became president, um, an, a, a complete, you know, head of the agency. Um, and that guy quit after one year for some reason. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and now they're back to having an acting head again. I don't know why they don't confirm her in the Senate yet, but um, she's the one who came out um, a week or two ago and said that uh, they're, they're doing everything they can, rushing as quickly as possible on this uh, autopilot investigation. So I think this comes to a head and, and the, the liabilities are massive. It, it, like Mark said, it could, it could bankrupt the company um the uh, amount of uh, I've, I've modeled out you know how many fsd uh, autopilot um uh sales they've had back from when the price was only five thousand, and it comes to as of q3 cumulative uh 3.7 billion dollars that's just for starters and that's about 18 percent of their equity um then you've got the uh, class action lawsuits that would would ensue and that's even that's even worse and um hey so motorhead isn't yeah. it more? Didn't he say on the call that there's 400,000 FSDs on the road? So 
wasn't the beginning price was like w- was like five million. Oh, I see. What did you say? Three point seven. Yeah, maybe that's an average between the two because now it's what like fifteen. So, so I, I, I use I use uh, Troy Test likes um, take. Yeah, that's a good number. I'm sorry, yeah, that's so, a good number. Yeah. yeah so I, yeah. I, I just multiply that by each quarter's deliveries and yeah. Uh, and and it's mostly in, in in North America, and the take rate is like I mean it, it went from a high of thirty nine percent of all volumes in in twenty nineteen in one quarter, and now it's down to eight percent. Eight percent. Yeah, yeah. Four four billion sounds about right. You said three point seven. Three point seven as of Q three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I might, yeah, I because my guess on top of my head would be about four billion. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah, it, it could be four billion as as of uh, Q four. We'll see. But the, it's it's just interesting to see if you look at the uh, if you look at a chart of the take rate. I mean, it's just like plummeting. <laughs> Nobody wants to have any of it. Yeah, hey, guys. Let me. Um, this is a little bit of a segue, but um, just thinking. About, if you don't mind, I, I'd like to take this conversation in a slightly different direction. We're gonna go to Max and then. Uh, Amy and average Joe, but question for you guys, just reflecting on what you were you saying earlier, you know, let's say Tesla makes two dollars, three dollars a share, whatever. Maybe it's less, maybe it's more, but they're gonna have down earnings in twenty twenty three. It's pretty obvious. Um, three dollars a share, round number on, you know, three billion shares is nine billion dollars. If it's two dollars a share, it's six billion dollars. We're talking about a company now which has a market cap of five hundred and fifty billion. <laughs> five hundred and fifty billion Let that, <laughs> and let's not get into the cash flow numbers because mark as you put out in a lot of the tweets the cash flow numbers were a complete disaster in, in 2022 but as we look ahead mark because you know i'm trying to think let, let's argue the opposite let's try to make the bull case right so let's say okay this is a down year yada yada fine volumes grow but at what price of course and as you look ahead and let's say ev adoption rate continues to go up okay fine but let's come back to another existential question for um, Tesla, which is a competition. Uh, I want to go to Motorhead first and then to you, Mark. Um, Motorhead, can you talk about the competition and why now may not be a, really be more concerned about the competition as opposed to years past? So talk about the competition, Motorhead, and Tesla's market share going forward as you see it. I know, I know in Korea, there's China, you know, you've got in Europe, you've got Daimler, you know, BMW, BMW, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But talk about the competitive threat and what do you see happening to Tesla's market share, Motorhead? Well, I think I think that the uh, the, the timing of their price cuts coincides with with competition heating up. And it coincides also the, the reason competition is heating up is because there's a, a larger supply of chips, which which um, all these guys who wanted to. And, and there's so much more chips in, in, in your in, in an electric vehicle than there are in in uh, ICE vehicles. But the point is, uh, the competition is slowly creeping up. It's been pathetic up to now. I mean, they're, you know, Jaguar I-Pace. I mean, I think they make 100 units a month. And, um, you know, uh, now you've got stuff like Polestar. You've got um, the Kia. Kia, by the way, was asked if they would um, lower their prices because their, their EV6 model is like selling like hotcakes. And so is the Hyundai Ionic. Um, I, uh, Kia said they, they would not par- they would not lower their prices. They're not participating, and I think what's what's happened is that you uh, there the, there's so many Teslas. Like if you go to so- somewhere like I mean California, Vancouver, oh my God, it's like every other car is a Tesla. Um, I think the market's saturated, and I think their models are old and stale. And you've got um, 18 new EVs that were launched in 2022 that will be in full production this year. And you've got another 36 models. This is just in North America. Another 36 new EVs coming out this year. Mark, you want to speak to the competition and their market share? Well, I'll just add to that that the only reason uh, Tesla sold as many cars as it did in, in, uh, in 2022, which, of course, by the way, as usual, was a huge disappointment versus what they were supposed to sell if you asked you know, a bull in 2021, how many they'd sell in 2020. The only reason they did it is there's still a long wait to get a Kia EV6, a Hyundai Ionic 5, a Mustang Mach-E, um, a BMW uh, i4. There's still a long wait for all the cars that compete, excuse me, with Tesla. So, and and so to, to, to Motorhead's point, uh, 
production is is going to be much greater this year and next year for all those competing models. And then you won't have to settle for a Tesla because you can't get a Mustang Mach-E or, a, or, an e, or a Kia EV6 for six months, right? Uh, Ford is hugely ramping production. And then, of course, there's General Motors, which until now has only had the Bolt models, which is actually a great little EV, you know, for the price, especially for the price. But this year, GM is rolling out several other real, you know, EVs that will compete and they're going to have real production, you know, like in the hundreds of thousands as things go on. I think their new factory, their first new factory just opened, I think, or is about to open with, with LG, the Ultium factory. So the, the quality of the competition starting in about, I would say, 2021 uh, became better than any Tesla. I mean, a number of competitors became better cars. You just couldn't get the damn things, but you're going to be able to get the damn things starting later this year. And that's a big problem uh, for Tesla. So you, do you therefore suspect, Mark, that there uh, must uh, goals or proclamations about 50% unit growth in the future. Do you think those are unrealistic or they're going to require, or again, you can sell anything at a price. They're going to require much lower prices. Uh that's right. You just said it. You can sell anything at a price. They would to get to that kind of growth from here, from this baseline, from the the Q4 baseline of of let's call it 1.6 million. Uh, there's no way they're going to be able to grow 50 percent of that a, a year from there without price cuts beyond mm -hmm. the ones they just made. And they don't have much room to cut because the next cut, you know, they're they're breaking even, and the cut after that, they're losing money. So. Yeah, I mean that's completely completely unrealistic thing to happen. It was really easy to do it when you had no competition and you were starting off a base of twenty thousand cars a year, but um, very different. I mean, hell, BMW sells two and a half million cars a year. Okay, I use this as an example a lot. The last time I looked, BMW had a market cap of um, sixty something billion. I think. Hang on one second. I'll just check real quick. I mean, to me, the analog for Tesla in the past had always been BMW that, you know, it could, maybe it can get to the size of BMW and be worth what BMW is worth. Yeah. So BMW's market cap, uh, uh, 59 billion euros. So, you know, whatever that is in dollars, 60 something billion. So, you know, which is like what, like, you know, uh, one ninth of what, of what <clears throat> Tesla is now, something like that. So, um, but now I'm starting to think Tesla can't be BMW in terms of image, because it's slashing prices. When's the last time BMW put through big price cuts in, in December and then big price, price cuts again in January? And now Tesla's starting to look more like, I don't know, Toyota or something. Wait, 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 Mark, yeah, Mark, so you're saying to Tesla is basically just another auto company? Is that what you're saying? It's, ba it's ba just another auto company, and it's completely losing its, its prestige image. Look, there's always going to be some people, let's call them not cutting-edge people, who think, Tesla's, you know, still a prestige car, but, you know, then there were people who were buying, you know, Playboy T-shirts and air fresheners, you know, long after the the mystique of a Playboy club was gone for, for you know, people with, let's say, with real money, you know, prestige car buyers. So, yeah, I mean, it, they're totally degrading the brand in a way that BMW never did, you know? Yeah, 100%. And Motorhead, um, that's great, Mark. Motorhead, I'll get away. And I just put up in the... Uh in the nest um a tweet from new constructs if you look up there you'll see the uh market share data for europe um and <laughs> it makes certainly in europe makes uh, tesla look like a pretty marginal player and i believe the same thing has become increasingly true in china um i mean motorhead hasn't hasn't uh, uh you could speak to europe you could speak to the u.s but particularly china has been an area of focus for you hasn't tesla's market share just been collapsing in china recently motorhead um, they, they do and they don't, it's really, it, so it, it was collapsing and then they implemented these, um, price cuts in late October. They saw a big wave again, but, uh, let me just tell you that, um, that the month of December was the first time ever that they've seen a massive, um, year on year decline in their, in their, um, deliveries in China. It was down like 20% year on year. 
and uh, production was down Q on Q. It was just, I mean, it's a total disaster. And, and, and even Musk said on the earnings call that, you know, the real competition they face is in China. I disagree. I think they face it worldwide. But in China, um, let me tell you something about the Chinese. Um, they, 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 they buy stuff. They, they want the newest. OK, so they want the new, newest of the new. And um, Tesla has been sort of like saturating the market there. And now you've got all these like, l- look at Neil. They, that, that, that piece of shit has launched like five EVs and they're, they're still launching more. Um, you know, that, that's incredible. They're, they've got an R&D to sales ratio of like, you know, 25%. They're doing a really good job. And th- those cars are smart cars, on, you know, like smartphones on, on, on four wheels. So the competition definitely is steeper in China. And yet that factory makes most of their money. This is what I see as like the, the huge sort of risk for that for, for Tesla in, in 2023. Let- let me, let me comment on that, uh, Motorhead, and to George's point, too, about market share. The factory in China had been making most of their money. They just cut prices in China to a starting price of $33,000 for the Model 3 and $38,000 for the Model Y. Now, to George's point, I'm sure that'll maintain their market share, or at least I suspect it will, and maybe even grow it. But, you know... That's if that's the real definition of profitless prosperity. How much money can they make at thirty three grand for the Model Three and thirty eight thousand for the Model Y? Not much, but keep in mind that their um, that their pre tax profit margin, just based on what they disclosed in the twenty twenty one ten k, if you back everything out, they were probably making like twenty seven percent pre tax margins. Uh yeah, but there's one thing, and this was pointed out to me actually by. Um, because uh, I missed it. Jim Chanos pointed it out to me that um, the cars they sold in Europe for, for $60,000, that counted for the China profits. Of course, definitely. Oh, okay. Okay. I, I hadn't realized that. I'm just thinking the China market. So so um, if you and factor Europe, in that Europe is going away because uh, they have to ramp up uh, the, the Berlin plan. Yeah, right. So th- I guess, right. Okay, fine. So that's to my point that I think the China profits are going to, are going to disappear, and yet the, the Europe prof because of China pricing, the European price cuts, and now the European production shift. And meanwhile, they've cut the European prices, so they'll have you know lowish price, lowest profits there. Like the U.S. profits are going to be this year lowish because of the the huge cuts. Exactly, and so if you see a you know tough demand situation for Teslas because people don't really want to buy them because there's so many other choices you could see both the China factory and the Fremont factory um being sacrificed so that the uh, the the Berlin and Austin factories can ramp up production to 80% capacity utilization that that's going to be a mess but why should the 80% capacity utilization even really matter if the depreciation right now is only as if it were at 15 percent utilization or whatever the number is because because break even comes above 65 to 70 percent capacity yep. yeah but why should but right now they're pretending i mean i'm just throwing this out there right now they're pretending on their dna i believe that they're that they're at 80 percent utilization even though they're not because they're only depreciating a small part of the factory and the tooling right right so so, I mean, so wh- why will it make any difference if in, in terms of actual utilization, they go from, um, I don't know, whatever, 20 percent to, to 80 percent if if the if the P&L right now pretends they're already at 80 percent? No, it's, it's not because they, they've you know, like I said, they, they 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 account for depreciation on a per unit basis. Yeah. So so you just said something about, well, they're going to they got to take it to 80 percent because that'll make difference. I'm asking you why it'll make a difference. Oh, because, uh, I, I, you know, that's a good question. And, and I think my gut feeling is that um, that they they have some issues with their accounting methods that uh, are going to come to a head, which means they're going to have to recognize. Um, OK, well, yeah. I, you know. I, I, I look, you're, you're actually probably I'm sure you're better on the the absolute really into the weeds of the auto industry because it's your specialty. But it seems to me that if if um, if PwC 
hasn't made them do that by now. And if PwC just let them recognize the FSD revenue, that it's just not going to happen. I mean, it's not going to happen until maybe after some giant blow up and PwC becomes Arthur Anderson, you know? Yeah, I agree. Uh, by the way, P- PwC uh, is in big trouble in Brazil, by the way. Um, they they were they're now being focused on for having um, approved of uh, one of the biggest frauds in, in Brazil. Right. Yeah, let's, well, let, you, if you don't mind, guys, let's let's uh, we've gone down this rabbit hole. Enough. Let's get let's work some other questioners into the uh, mix. I want to go to Amy and then uh, Rob and then average Joe. Amy, good to see you. What's up? Good morning. Um, I just wanted to go back to the. FSD investigation, um, and, and I don't know because I don't own the Tesla, but when these people sign up for beta, I have to assume there's some sort of liability waiver for Tesla, right? Does anybody know if no. like, what their, what their li- oh, yes. liability or culpability yes. is? Yes, Tesla takes absolutely no responsibility, and, um, and they make that very clear in the documents, which, by the way, is the difference between Tesla and an auto company that actually offers level three or higher, Mercedes takes all responsibility for accidents on its new level three system. <clears throat> Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, because I actually think that the, the FSD thing is, is a bigger deal than, I mean, I feel like it kind of got glossed over yesterday, but I do feel like it's a pretty big deal. Um, but I wasn't sure about their liability or culpability and all of it. That's great. Th- good question, Amy. Thanks. That was it. Thanks, Amy. Let's go to Rob, then Average Joe, then Osgore. Uh, Rob, good to see you. What's up? Yeah, good morning. Thanks for hosting this space as usual, and thanks to all the contributors. Uh, it's just an observation more than a question. Uh, having been an analyst you know, for 25 years or so, uh, most recently doing uh, chemicals and materials, the thing that stands out to me is uh, coming from chemicals and materials land, there's two types of products. You have specialty products that fill some unique uh, demand need or product characterization. There's a limited number of producers and the prices don't go down. They go up in time. They're generally uh, have some kind of economic moat around technology or uh, specif- uh, specs. Then you have commodities. <laughs> commodities will change price up and down depending on demand and supply, depending on the costs of inputs, And that, to me, is sort of cutting through everything that Tesla sells. Their cars, their (laughs) battery packs, their solar panels. There is no uh, technological moat around these products. People will tell you that there is. But I think if you look around and you take in all the available data on what is coming, uh, you know, in terms of changes in uh, ADAS systems and in terms of changes of uh, vision systems that, you know, this, this has more the characteristics of a commodity product than it does as a specialty product. Uh, so to your point, Musk admitted that. Musk said literally a few months ago, and you can find it online, yes. that, that Tesla is worthless without, uh, without its autonomy, without its full self-driving. He basically admitted that that's the only real differentiator for Tesla. And of course, we all know what we know about that. So yes, you're, make, your own, <laughs> make your own judgment about that. You know. And the other thing, and it's Jim Chanos, I will credit for coming up with this, and maybe he got it from somewhere else, is yeah, l- let's assume they get to something that resembles autonomy. The liability from an insurance standpoint, will reside with the with the automaker <laughs> uh, for having that system. Yes. So there's a lot of things that people don't. If there's a lot of first order thinking in the world. I think, and I'm I'm not trying to uh, put myself up as someone above that. I'm certainly guilty of it from time to time. But people just don't follow to second and third and fourth <laughs> orders on what these things will mean for the business model in the future. Thanks again, and everyone have a great yep. day. Yes. Thanks, Rob. Great questions from you. All right, we're going to do Average Joe, Osgore, and then Hans Brick. Average Joe, good to see you. What's up? Hey, guys. Um, I'm just wondering how you guys feel about uh, you know Tesla not having an, um, their own banking system. I think it was that could have come in play with these price reductions not actually happening and and actually offering you know zero percent interest uh, in a longer financing term 
to uh, keep their um, value of vehicles, you know, stable. Um, second, um, you know, they, they were what, 2% of the, of the what, hybrid and electrical vehicle of United States sales. And if interest rates keep on going up and, and, and you, you, I think uh, uh, someone mentioned earlier, one of the speakers about, uh, yes, there's going to be huge increase and there is delay. I, I write, I currently am in line for a boat EUV, um, which, you know, is $32,000 with the $7,500 discount plus the GM discount of $2,500 you know, roll that in, it's a $22,000 car, basically, and uh, load it. So my point is that, um, you know, they, the, the, there's no competition right now for Tesla because there's the, such a delay on vehicles for electric side on the, the big three side. They, you know, um, they're still having trouble uh, producing vehicles with the, because of the chip. So um, I think when that really comes out, and, I, you know, I, I still say that, uh the auto industry is very lean right now, and and it's it's like a created lean because people are still buying cars at a heavier price. But yeah, what do you guys think about you know the, if they would have opened their own finance and uh, as well, um, you know, how someone could- asked um, someone asked the CFO about that. I think Jonas did on the call, and he said he doesn't want to tie up capital that way. He said um, he said they they think they have better uses for capital than set up captive finance. Tesla doesn't have the the balance to to I mean look this whole insurance stuff and share <laughs> it I mean it's like it's complete ludicrousy I mean uh, they they don't have twenty two billion dollars in cash I mean it's just you know they they might have it at, at the last day of the quarter but I mean <laughs> the very next day they're they're cash hungry which is why they opened up this seven billion dollar credit facility I mean. Uh, it, it's just it's ridiculous if you look at their interest income as a as a percentage of cash it, it's like it was 0.7 percent in q4 i mean what the fuck who's i mean <laughs> he, there is no share buyback i mean please you know and there's no way that they're going to be and look at their leasing uh rate i mean that's gone down from like 13 percent to seven percent it's because they're they don't have the balance sheet i mean it, it, you know, eventually i mean you know um, when there is a recession, I mean, you know, it, it, it helped prolong, you know, some of the big three, um, dinosaurs when the 08 situation happened, like Daimler and, and, uh, GM financial and, and those, um, it, it, even, uh, back then, uh, Chrysler's, uh, arm helped them stay above water for, for a lot longer than that. And, and then eventually, you know, um, you know things happen, but that I I guess I mean you're you're right. If he doesn't have the funding, and that's what I thought he started this insurance uh, part of Tesla was to to yeah. somehow use that money to invest back in the company. He, he so, did the you know, he did the insurance stuff because um it it, it would let um people who who wouldn't otherwise be able to afford um a Tesla to to be able to afford a Tesla. So that I, I think we I think we process that. That's a that's a great question, Joe. Great answer. Let's move on. I want a lot of people want to speak, so I want to keep this movie along. We're going to go to uh, Osgore and then Hans Brick. Osgore, good to see you. What's up? Hi, I thank you, George. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we hear you. Go ahead. Okay, perfect. So the only thing, the only reason I think this company is going up like a penny stock, a six hundred billion dollar company, is the gamma squeeze that uh, you guys talked about at the beginning of the spaces. And I think we need to understand a little more. And I have a question right there, a technical question, but I think we need to understand. So people are buying, um, uh, you know, the zero data expression calls and mass, right? So let's let's keep it simple. You, Musk, Gamma Squeeze Fund, as Tommy Thornton, Thornton likes to call it, come to me. I'm the option market maker. You pay 25 cents and buy $160 call from me Friday, Okay. And by the end of today, that option is worth just making up numbers, $10. And on the way, I just hedged my delta, which caused the gamma squeeze, okay? Uh, but presumably, the buyers of these options are not exercising this. They, did, they are not getting the delivery of the underlying stocks. And on the other side of the equation, the market makers, they are not in the market. They're in the market. Their job is to buy and sell volatility. They are they are not in the market for uh, warehousing the stock. So, my question is, when the options expire, 
assuming that the buyers of these options are not exercising it and getting the glory of the uh, stock, aren't the market makers supposed to sell these stock that they used for hedging hands? Shouldn't the stock go down? If well, not, I assume that I, I, I assume that that um, that the, that the if the people don't take don't take the stock, they just roll over into the next option. Or uh, let, let me put it this way: this works as long as the stock keeps going up. It can keep going up. The second it reverses and the, and the option drying power drives up, it it'll turn around and just go in the other direction. No, I understand it, Mark, but if you look at the volumes of zero day to expiration versus seven day to expiration, like at the end of the day, for example, the volumes are the volume differences are humongous. I still can't understand how the stock cannot go down if not after hours, but definitely on Monday mornings. But anyway, if, if anyone has an answer, I'll I'll appreciate it. Thank you very much. That was my question. I don't know if um Mark answered as best as I could. I don't have any particular insight on that. Um, so, I, I, look, gamma squeezes work both ways. Okay, um, when, when the gamma squeeze ends, it's like it's like the reverse, you know, situation. So, and that's what we saw in December. Yes. All right. All right. Let's move on. If anybody else has an answer on that, that'd be great. All right. Let's go to Hans Bricks, please. Hans Bricks, uh, four years. Yeah, I, I got a quick uh, answer on that because I actually was trading some of those. Um, and I was banking on it kind of uh, basically falling off, off of the 180. So I got a couple, I, I basically doubled my money in like 10 minutes. Uh, right <laughs> but, but I was, I was actually, I was, I was planning on it. It should have really dropped to like 176, given the fact that most of these, especially retail, they don't have the cash to exercise. So I think it's either, either the market makers are just keeping the, they're actually, uh, uh, <clears throat> Not positive now, not long, which they shouldn't be, but we'll see in, in the next two days. Okay. Uh, but but the other thing is that you had SPY, I mean, you saw SPY just die in the last five minutes, right? And that's normal, right? Because you got the same effect. Everyone's closing out. Um, but the, uh, yeah, I am I actually think that there was probably some people actually using that day as exit liquidity too. Um, you know, if you if you were kind of freaked out about Musk and him, kind of being a, a, uh, um, a an absent CEO and you were an institution, you wanted to start kind of de-risking, you know, Friday was a great day to do that. Um, so, but that should have added to the selling pressure and it obviously wasn't there. So, you know, um, yeah, really weird. But what I wanted to talk about is, uh, so I, I've been in the auto industry for, for a couple of decades. I worked at Ford GM. I've talked to Motorhead before. Um, pretty bearish on Tesla, but, Going back to what Mike was saying, or sorry, Mark was saying about kind of um, the demand thing and with Tesla. So I think, yeah, it's clearly overvalued, but I still think with 2023, there could be, I mean, they could make their 1.8 million number. And the reason isn't because of the Cybertruck, because that's, that's not going to come in, in the volume. The reason is because there was so much demand for Tesla. I think Mark covered it off. It was there weren't any other competitors but especially in the fact in california and the west coast generally is that with gas prices because gas prices were so fucking high people don't want to pay six bucks they can't pay six bucks so they were you know desperately looking for an electric vehicle and that's what was driving the demand for for tesla uh in in large part and you can see that in the region the other thing is that california is ideal because of its weather location and, and kind of density for electric vehicles. Iowa, not so much. You know, Michigan, not so much. You know, the Northeast, not so much. But it's, it's, it's better, I would argue, because there is that density. But what happens is if we actually have a real recession, right, oil's going to, it should theoretically drill down, right? So let's talk about like $40 oil, you know, maybe, maybe $30 oil if it gets that bad. That's going to make gasoline cheap, which is what's supposed to happen. And so now ICE vehicles are, again, a competitive, much more desirable versus when, when gas is right now, let's call it $3 uh, per, per, uh, per gallon in the United States versus what it was like, you know, over four and a half um, on average. 
So that's going to be a real dynamic that actually, you know, depending on what the economy and what gas prices are, crude does, that's going to potentially drive Tesla and demand for EVs higher or could send it lower. So I think a lot of times what the, what the bulls don't understand is the presence of alternatives and real kind of market forces in terms of, of, of supply and demand for a particular vehicle. You know, um, the, the one counter to that is the $7,500 tax credit didn't exist uh, for Tesla last year. I mean, it only existed in like the last two weeks or whatever when they essentially paid it out of their own pocket. So that, that does offset the cost thing. But, you know, to your point a little bit, but more to going back to the other competition question, which I forgot to point out because you're seeing all these headlines. Oh, Tesla is going to start a price war in electric vehicles. Tesla has essentially just cut its prices to basically match the competition. I mean, if you look at the prices of the Mach-E and the Ionic 5 and the EV6 and, and, some, and whatever, you know, um, Tesla is now only in that range. It's not cheaper than those guys. And those guys still make nicer cars. So Tesla may actually have to, to, to the point made earlier, by Motorhead, they might have to cut again. They might have to actually be, become cheaper than the, than the Mach-E and the EV6 and the Ionic 5 to get people to buy them once production ramps up on those other cars. Yeah, I, I fully agree. And I think that the best case is that, you know, they'll do for, for 2023, that they'll do, you know, uh, 1.8 to 2 million, right? Probably yeah. a little bit, but uh, I don't see it really being materially higher just because of the economic conditions that we kind of currently foresee in the United States. Uh, I wanted to just quickly comment on... Uh, Hans, if you have one more quickie, because we've got a huge line of people wanting to get up here, so please keep it brief. Okay, the the situation in, in Europe uh, with uh, ramping up uh, the, the the plant in Berlin, um, that's going to be... There's, there's a reason why I think they haven't aggressively done it. One is because of labor, but also energy. So, basically... Yep industry in Europe, they can't actually ramp up because everyone's on basically like an energy usage kind of, um, you know, moratorium or, or whatever the, the, the right term is. And so um, that's a big problem. And even if it, uh, you know, once we get out of the winter and into the summer, energy is still going to be prohibitively expensive. So it, it, it that's not factored in to your full year 2022 numbers. But going into 2023, huh. you huh. see a fixed cost. Hans Blick, sorry, I got, I got, I got, I got to counter that. Um, that they, they, they have such a warm winter in in Europe that um, they've actually got um, LNG surplus right now. But, but are they allowed? Are, are is industry allowed to basically go back to normal <clears throat> production levels? I, I, I'm not on the ground, and I don't have the the insight on the on the manufacturing kind of base level but what i understood is that they were kind of more or less really much wound down in terms of of uh energy usage to conserve i i i just don't see it as a problem i think the biggest problem that they face in in germany is um the high turnover you've got uh, massive amounts of people who are who are um quitting Tesla that, that they were hired a year ago and they're quitting and they can't find enough people to to work there. Right. Here's my point is that the fixed cost and the whole the whole argument from the bulls that you know there's op leverage because they have uh, more units, but that's assuming potentially a fixed cost. Yeah, well, look, there, there, there is no operating leverage if, if your fixed cost base is rising by 30 percent. Operating leverage, by definition, means that you cover your fixed costs and have incremental units um, uh, making your profits grow. So that's, got, not, that's not happening. Yeah, let, let me let me interrupt. So, I'm, I'm so guys, yeah, hold, hold on one second. Just hold on. Hans, we've covered this in great detail. It's a great question. I really want to let someone else uh, ask a question, if you don't mind. I want to go to I want to go to Grant, and then I yeah. want to go to and then I want to go to uh, Fi. Grant, good to see you. What's your What's your question, my friend? Yeah, my question is then based on all this, why is Elon so um, positive that this is going to be the most you know, the, the the richest, wealthiest company in the world? 
because he's a liar and a stock promoter and a fraudster who dumps stock on a regular basis. And in fact, I think the first time he said that, if I'm not mistaken, was at the annual meeting this spring. And the very next fucking day, he dumped billions of dollars worth of stock. So what does that tell you? I assume you weren't born yesterday. I wasn't. But, but other than that, what, what would it be? Other than that? That's not enough. I mean, he, I, yeah. he, he might need to he might need to buy out that Twitter bond for three billion dollars that yeah, comes I mean, that he, comes due at the end of this month. But this wasn't the first time he said it. He said it multiple times and always dumped stock after that. So I'm answering well, your he, question. He admitted by, here. He admitted here that he sold ten billion dollars worth of stock to put himself in a situation where he could he wouldn't be in a default situation again. And yes, he, I agree that he is a promoter. Every company needs a good promoter, and I'm not defending him, but. But what what I'm saying is, I mean, like, but you're, I, saying I the, your he, you're saying he's the biggest fraudster in, in mankind's but, history. But, but no, no. You asked me a question, which is why yeah. would he say it's it's going to be the biggest company in the world? And I answered it. He keeps saying that because he wants to keep the stock up so he can dump into it. Yeah, he, he sold it on the way down, though. He didn't buy any on the way up from 112. He had no choice but to sell it on the way down. He had to. He had to pay all these Twitter bills. Yeah. And and he and the last two times he said that he dumped stock afterwards. So to me, that's a pretty good explanation for why he'd say it. <laughs> Thanks for the question, Graham. Um, let's move on now to Fi. Fi, good to see you. What's on your mind? Hey, good morning. Uh, it's been a while since I've seen you around. Um, how are you doing? And uh, also, hi to Grant and everyone else on this stage. Good to see you, fine. I'm, I'm better. I, uh, I had a rough going market the last couple of weeks, but I also had a pretty nasty uh, bout with COVID. So good to be back. What's on your mind, Fi? Yeah, so um, we've been discussing Tesla in a bunch of spaces now. And, um, you know, uh, there's uh, mixed uh, feelings about it. A lot of people are, you know, on the Elon bandwagon and not really you know, looking at the fundamentals of the company. Um, early on, f even for myself, uh, I was an early investor in Tesla, but even myself um, was very skeptical because uh, how can a new company have the same market cap as all the other companies combined? So that was a little bit of a red flag for me. You know, I was uh, being cautionary. <clears throat> and now, you know, we see now uh, that the stock has dumped like almost 70 percent that most of the conviction was in elon not really the company and we'll, we're seeing um company pretty much hit fair value but we were we were um kind of mostly kind of looking at you know what what, what is the resistance to scaling for this company right if their goal is you know for evs to completely take over the ice market which um which is a huge undertaking if you look at um, the demand for ICE vehicles around the world. Um, what is the resistance for scaling? So basically access to um, raw, raw the, the, rare, the rare metals, you know, um, where are you going to get them? Uh, how are you going to um, overcome the political situations? Are you going to set up, um, you know, mining in, in other places? Um, and, and, you know, um, how are you going to convince people to give up their, you know, cheap ICE vehicles for um, uh, electric, and as well as uh, is our infrastructure even ready for all all of these uh, cars to be pumped? So, uh, and and in terms of the company, I do believe you know uh, they will be very important um, just because of this, uh, of the way they're positioned for the you know the energy transition, the the green energy that they're kind of um, you know that's their that's their thing, right? So. Uh, and with the robotics and the FSD and all that stuff. That's I'm sorry. Out. Did you, uh, sorry. Did you say the robotics? Yeah. What are you talking yeah. about? Uh, so I, I see them more as a, as a technology company. Rather really? Than a Why? Company. Why? Because uh, they're, 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 their cars are basically robots, man. No, the cars are robots, man. Have a death <laughs> machine. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm an automation engineer. I'm a robotics designer. So what do you, I kind of know what I'm what talking about. What do you think about, about Boston Dynamics? Yeah, it's uh, also a robotics company. They're yeah, doing I, a lot of research. Do you, do you think Do you think Tesla has anything close to that? I know it's made up of a bunch of servos and a PLC. So that's I, a robot. 
Uh, but how, so how does Tesla match up to Boston Dyma- Dynamics and robotics? Please tell me. Well, well, they're working on that humanoid, right? They're, yeah, they're working on <laughs> he as well. Can I, what, can, wait, I, what? can I try to be Switzerland here? Just hold on for a second. Right? I think getting into a spat over what label we're going to call this company is really not. Well, not, that cuts to the core, though, George, well, because uh, because well, the myth on, is that it's a technology company or a tech company. And, and of course, it's nonsense because none of their tech is differentiated from anybody else's tech. Well, and in well, some ways, it's now inferior. Go ahead. Sorry. Listen, look, there, there may be a lot of automation robots in there, as Fi says, but that's not really the issue. The issue is, you know, relative to everybody else and the company. And the, and the self-driving cars and all that sort of stuff. Forget about what's under the hood, all right? So let's not get into, I mean, Fi's an engineer, let's not get into an argument over what's under the hood, all right? I mean, bottom line is, I mean, if it's if it's so special, you know, why do they have to cut prices to keep growing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? <laughs> so, 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 so let's not, I don't want to get into an argument about what's under the hood. So, so Fi, is there, is there a question that you'd like to ask? Because I don't want to get into a debate over it's a robotics company, it's not a robotics company. I don't think it's helpful. Is there a question you have, Fi? Um, no, I just wanted to kind of make those general comments. Uh, just That's still great. watching the company as well. But, yeah, I'm interested to hear um, your thoughts and comments. I, I appreciate your input very much. I just – it's helpful to try to remain civil in here. That, that's great. Appreciate your input because you, you have a different seat from all of us. You've forgotten more about technology than any of us will ever know. So, so thanks for your insight. Oh, we have – oh, just the man here, Mr. JC, who's one of the most prolific Tesla – uh, Twitter uh, observers on the scene. Um, JC, it's first time I actually think we speak. Uh, please welcome to the stage. Um, any thoughts, comments, reactions, JC? Thank you. Your- Thank you very much for uh, having me. Um, I just have a simple comment. I think this space has been great. Um, Tesla had orders in the second half of 22 that was about 43% of their production rate. So let's call that 50%. And they ended the year with about two weeks worth of uh, backlog left. And on the call, Musk said that orders were running at two times um, production, which if you assume that he was talking about year to date because he didn't quantify the period, that implies that the price cut only added about six weeks worth of demand. Um, you know, the history of Tesla around price changes is every time they cut prices, they get a big surge in orders. But then that spike is very short lived and it re- basically order rates revert back to kind of pre-existing trend levels within like 10 days. And you see that in some third party data already that um, orders are probably already back at um, pre price cut trend levels. Um, That would imply that the last two months of Q1 probably only add another month worth of um, demand. Um, The implication of all this is that Tesla is going to be in the same position they were at the end of 2022 sometime in late March or April. Um, the other thing I'd add is the situation in China is much worse than this. Um, the order spike from the January price cut was bigger than the order spike from the October price cut, but not by some large order of magnitude. Um, and that also should burn out sometime in, like, let's say, March. Um, so, so J- JC, yeah. um, those are all great observations. And the, and my and I know you probably have more that are similar. And to, to that, I would say, yes, that's all downside from 1.8 to 2 million units. But if you take their guidance at its word, which, by the way, is always too optimistic, they still only earn in the twos per share or something like that. So, yes, what you're saying is maybe they don't even sell 1.8 or whatever. I'm saying, hey, let's assume they sell 1.8 or 1.9 or 2. It's still a you know a two fifty earner or whatever, and Motorhead thinks it's lower, and you know maybe it's three dollars even. It's almost like that could all be right, but it's a disaster even if Tesla's number comes true. I, I'd also like to add, but by the way, JC, uh, great to have you on here. By the Thank way, you. Um, uh, the uh, so I'm looking at uh, the weekly insured data in in um, in China, and so uh, it, it's funny. So. Uh, <laughs> Weekly insured units were five thousand three hundred units in 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 um, on October seventeenth. Okay, and then um, they announced a price cut on on October twenty fourth, and it spiked for one, two, three, four, four weeks. It spiked to sixteen thousand units 
uh, by by the week of um, November 21st. And then lo and behold, um, five weeks later, they, they announced the, 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 the next biggest price cut. Yeah, I, I, I think to combine the two points that um, you both are making, I think the I don't think they can allow the delivery number to miss materially, which means they're going to be cutting prices again in like three months. Exactly. And then the question is, um, what does that do to your ability to finance the car? Because who's going to um, finance cars <laughs> where their prices are getting cut every three months? <laughs> there is that, that, that Elon Musk, you know, uh, I know a lot about engineering and physics and whatnot, but um, he, he knows nothing about the auto industry, which is why they don't have full model changes. Because if they would have, you know, fully remodeled um, the, the, the Model 3, it would be selling like hotcakes right now. Uh, but the point is that um, that uh, they don't have full model changes and it's getting stale, which means they can only cut prices to increase volume. So the higher the volumes are, I, I think the lower the profits are. Yeah, and the higher the volumes are going to come at much lower prices at much lower margins. JC, I really value your input. Please stay on stage. I, I, we're going to go on for a few more minutes. I'm sure there'll be more questions for you. So please stay there. It's a real treat to hear your voice. I really appreciate your input. Um, I want I want to go to uh, follow the money and then future uh, investor. Follow the money. Uh, the floor is yours. Welcome. Thank you very much. I just have a few questions because there's a lot of people in this spaces that are, you know, a lot more smarter than me on markets, but it's pretty clear what's happening here. There's a lot of analysts that cover the stock and there's a lot of great data points that you've all made here. And I don't own a share an option on this on this stock. But how, what's your strategy against the, the, the fanboys? I mean, how do you how do you beat these people? Right. Because uh, you can mention all these other car companies and the valuation of Tesla. I couldn't name all of the, the CEOs and executives of those companies because nobody cares. So people buy this stock for other reasons than because it's a car company. And whether anyone here agrees with that, that's what you're up against. So what's a sustainable short strategy against the company when we're spending a lot of time here talking about all these data metrics when most so of the people I'll, don't care? I'll answer that. The, first of all, keep in mind the stock went from 400 to 100. So it's certainly not... Uh, Imper uh, invincible. The answer is that the bulk of it is still cars. And the bulk of the fanboys still think, oh, they're superior in cars, blah, blah, blah. When their neighbors get I Ionic 5s and BMW i4s and EV6s and mach -E's, it gradually will permeate their brains that it isn't there. And, and I think when the, the profits continue to disappoint, which they're going to do going forward, They'll gradually drift away. It's not going to happen overnight that all the fanboys desert the company, but gradually they will be peeled off into reality. And so there will be less and less, you know, buying power left to support this thing. Okay. So you think from, from current valuation, it, it, you can put together a, a pretty a good short thesis to, to continue short the stock? Well, fundamentally, I think I said at the beginning of the call, this stock is worth less than $20 a share. And by the way, at $15, at, at $20 a share, it would still have a 60 something billion dollar market cap, which is probably absurd. So yeah, fundamentally, technically, I, I mean, I don't know when the option gamma buying ends, but I do think, as I said, right at the beginning of the call, if I'm right that this January is just like a fierce bear market rally and analog to January 01, then that'll dry up you know, on February 1st or January 31st or maybe Monday. So, you know, I'm not I'm not concerned about that. I mean, there was no gamma buying when this thing went from 400 to 100. Right. I mean, that disappears and it reverses. And also, let me let me add, um, I think the, 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 the this, this is a good point. Uh, this is a good time to talk about the uh, potential catalysts that are coming besides, you know, what the stock has done this week or this this month. Um, we've got the March. Um, uh, investor Relations Day, IR Day, which is the first time they've ever done it, which to me seems like another sign of de desperation. But the point is that um, I, I think that the the first big catalyst to to really kick this stock down again is uh, Q1 results, which will probably be in late April. But um, as of now, I've got two billion dollars in gap net profits for for Q1 without you know without any like you know you know, egregiously bearish assumptions. 
And uh, the, the consensus right now for Q1 gap net profits is $3 billion. Right. So that motorhead. Let, let's move on. I want to go. To, we've got a huge stage here, so let's keep going. I want to go to Lindsay. Lindsay, uh, the floor is yours. Hey, everybody. Thank you for this. Thank you, George. Thank you, Mark. Um, I'm wondering if there's a tell in what several of us may be observing at Hertz lots around the country. I flew into and home from Logan uh, this week, last night, and there was just a glut of unrented Model 3s. And they (laughs) appear to be dumbing them down where they're even, you know, my aisle is President Circle and Five Star, which isn't so elite. I pay $30 a day on my corporate rate. And 40% of the unrented cars to choose from were, were Teslas. Does that have a any relevance to our view of the stock and the company? Well, maybe it means they've, as, as Motorhead said, maybe it means they've saturated the market for what used to be premium priced, you know, semi-premium electric cars. And the average car renter doesn't want to deal with that crap <laughs> other than as a novelty item. <laughs> I, I, by the way, Grant, Grant, thanks for that comment. Um, I've been seeing pictures of, of um, various different, you know, airports, um, <laughs> Uh, Hertz Hertz lots, which are filled with with um, with Model Threes and a few Model Ys. But the point is that um, they're pushing it on their customers, and most customers like have such trouble like learning how to use. I mean, I I, I went in a taxi that was a, mo- a Model Three. I should have canceled it when I saw you know <laughs> I saw it coming. But I mean, I couldn't fucking get out of the back door. I'm like, can you? Pl- <laughs> I had to ask the driver, like, how the fuck do I open the door? You can't open the door. Imagine if there's a fire. But the, the, what I'm trying to say is uh, I think the, the, the biggest thing about this Hertz deal, which, by the way, got it pumped up to got Tesla pumped up to, to its highest, you know, all time high share levels, is that um, the, the, the fact that they lowered prices so much is 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 really scary in the sense of residual value, re, resale value guarantees. OK. And they, I think they have something like a four to six billion dollar. Um, uh, uh, well, let's put it this way: in the past two years, they had four billion dollars of residual value, ga- resale value guarantees, and they lowered their prices by by fifteen percent on average. That's going to come back and bite them. And I've seen I've seen Mitsubishi Motors back in in uh, the the two uh, thousands, um, you know, blow a hole in their balance sheet and need to get back you know, bailed out by, uh, by, by the Mitsubishi group, um, because they, they, um, miscalculated the, uh, the value of their leases. Yeah. Mo- hey, Motorhead. Mo- yeah, mo- mo- hold on. Hold on. Whoa, 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 whoa. Motorhead and Spiegel, specific question. Can we, can we pivot just a little bit away from the, uh, the, uh, rental car rates and the, and the glut of Tesla cars and rental lots as Lindsay was highlighting and talk a little bit about what's happened to secondhand, Tesla um, prices. I know there were tweets a few weeks ago showing how they had fallen by like twenty percent. I think from like sixty-seven to fifty-five or something like that. So, first to Motorhead, then to Spiegel. Um, what's happening to Tesla used car prices, please? They're down about twenty percent um, in the past like month or or two, and the average used car price is down only about four or five percent. So um, it, it and, and this is going to I'm, I'm telling you, I, I don't think there's been enough work done. And I can't wait to speak to my my usual, you know, um, car makers um, after they report because they're all in silent period right now. But um, they, they've laid off on the lease. The legacy automakers have laid off on leases because it's too yeah. risky. And Tesla's increasing leases. And um, the whole thing has to do because it's too risky. They're happy to do like, you know, loans and stuff like that, but they're they're laying off on the leases. And by the way, the Tesla Model 3 has has dropped down on a, to a monthly rate lease rate of like, I think, three hundred ninety nine dollars, which is absolutely ridiculous. But the point is that if you lower the price of the new product, um, it means automatically that, you know, your used product is, is going to have a, a residual value decline that that really kills you. And I, I see after they did this price drop, I, th- I think one other huge risk is that um, they're going to get they're going to have to have impairments from from the cars that come off lease. And by the way, there's a shit ton of cars coming off lease at Tesla and um, they, they'll have to they'll have to book impairments on that. Mark, do you have, a, do you have, a, do you have a, anything to add? Otherwise, I'll go on to Rob. No, nope, nothing to add. Well said. All right. 
Well said. Thank you, Motorhead. Rob, you have a quick follow-up? Rob? Yeah. Uh, I think Motorhead might be the one to handle this, but um, any, if anyone can chime in. I think the question here and things that I've been doing in research is what happens to both the resale market and resale values of these vehicles at 10 years plus? Uh, and because there's a lot of people that bring up battery issues that if people are improperly charging batteries in the early life, they're not even making it uh, to the warranty period. Uh, and, you know, what would be the, the used market value of a vehicle or a residual value of a vehicle if it was on loan or on lease? If there's a, you know, again, I can't speak exactly, but I've seen certainly five digit numbers in terms of the price of the replacement battery. It becomes a decorative planter. <laughs> By the way, that's a great question because um, so Tesla's warranties are for I think it's like a um, hundred thousand miles or or um, or um, eight years. Okay, so the average American drives fourteen thousand miles a year, so that that equates to roughly seven years. Okay, and yes, Tesla's battery packs are really good and everything. But um, they, they, they will, I mean, batteries wear out, you know? And I mean, so the Nissan Leaf was a, was a huge failure and it lost Nissan tons of money because the battery after four years would, would, um, would run out. And the residual value was like 10% of what, what the purchase price was. Um, I, don't, I don't see Tesla getting in that situation, but I think the older that the fleet gets, yes, that is a huge risk. And it costs roughly twenty five thousand dollars to re replace a you know a, a Tesla battery pack, and this is why the whole EV thing is absolutely ridiculous on a residual value basis. And then this is why I think you know hat tip to Toyota for for staying out of this shit. I, I think Volkswagen is in, in deep trouble, given the fact you know that they jumped on this bandwagon like with with you know in full force. Great answer. All right, let's go to. I want to wrap this room up in a few minutes, so I want to move very quickly. Please, I'll give everyone one question. I want to get through this. Um, so this has been a great, great space. If there are any Tesla bulls that want to come up, you're welcome. It's a respectful room. So, you know, we, I invited a couple of Tesla bulls to come on, but unfortunately they had personal, uh, previously personal commitments. So anyway, because I've had some people complain this is a bear den. Well, it's free speech. and Anyone can say what they want. Um, let's go to Jerome and then future um, investor. Jerome, good to see you. The floor is yours. How you doing, everybody? Thanks for having me. Um, I, uh, I I used to work in Tesla and sales uh, out on Long Island uh, selling cars, and I think it was 2016. Um, so uh, definitely more on the bull side. Um, one thing I sort of wanted to add to something that that that, that a previous uh, uh, person person mentioned was uh, how to deal with sort of the fanboys and. I, I, I know a lot of those people and had to deal with a lot of those people and d d definitely frustrating personalities. Um, and s something else that I want to add to the narrative sort of is you're not just dealing with fanboys. I think you're, you're dealing with a company that's deeply political and not just political in the sense that it's something that the federal government wants to subsidize and whatnot, but it's it's climate change is an issue that the American people for whatever reason they, they've they've really internalized it and tesla was the first company to make that an issue and the first company to you know put that into a product in a way that resonated with them and i think that's something that's really hard to fight that type of brand loyalty is a really hard thing to to combat and i'm curious just to hear what the bears think about being up against that kind of force I'll, t I'll take that on. Um, two things. The American, most Americans really make climate change a rather low priority if you look at the list. And then if you tell them how much they have to pay to, you know, to essentially do nothing about it because it's all drop in the bucket stuff, then they would really not want to do it. I mean, if it came directly out of their pocket. But, but to your point about brand loyalty, um, Tesla had great brand loyalty because there was no EV6 or Ionic 5 or, or on the high end, Mercedes EQS, BMW iX, you know, now BMW i7, right? So it just didn't exist. So there was, there's no question that the best electric car in, in 2013 through, you know, let's say 
2019, 2020 was a Tesla and no one else was close, right? Unless you wanted to just spend no money and get a leaf or a bolt. But it's a totally different ball game now. And I'm telling you, man, I mean, listen, you're, as a car sales guy, I don't know if you're, are you still selling cars? Can I ask no, you? No, no, now I'm in, uh, in wealth management. Okay. So, you know, as a car sales guy, you had no competition. Okay. Now, when your neighbor has a Mach E or an EV6 or Ionic 5 or an i4, EQS, whatever it is, um, and, 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 and you see how much nicer the interior of his car is and the exterior and the build quality, you see that the, the real world range, not Tesla's bullshit claimed EPA numbers, is, is, is exactly the same. Sometimes, you know, 10 miles, 20 miles better, sometimes 10, 20 miles worse. And the charging speed is now the same or better in the case of the Korean cars. No, no, there's no such thing as brand loyalty then. It's like, you know, hey, that's a nicer car. I'm getting that car. And, and oh, and by the way, I now think Elon Musk is a, is a nut and a scumbag. So you put all that together. Yeah. And, and by the way, you know, I only think that's a factor in the U.S. In China, um, they don't even have Twitter. They don't care what Musk says politically in China, as long as he doesn't speak against China. There is just pure competition. It's like, oh, that Tesla was nice back in the day. But now, as, as Motorhead said, now look at the look at this Neo. Look at this X-Pang, you know, look at this, the newest BYD, the, the higher end BYD. That's the problem. There's not going to be brand loyalty when there's a nicer car out there. Thanks for that, Mark. It's a fantastic answer. Hey, Jerome, uh, DM me. I really liked your questions. We'll talk offline. Let's go to uh, Future Investor. Future Investor, the floor is yours. Future Investor, I don't know if you can hear me. I, uh, you must okay. be in the middle. Yep. There you go. Go. Hey, go. hey. hey good, good, to, hey. good to hear you. Go for it, Future. Yeah. Hey, George. Nice to talk to you. Uh, and just want to take a moment, you know, to commend you for the way that you're conducting these spaces. And I think you're fostering incredibly uh, productive discussion. So, you know, thanks again, if it hasn't been mentioned. Um, and, and Mark, hi. So I just watched the interview that you did uh, with Hugh Henry on his <laughs> show. And <laughs> so, you know, Hugh's more of a macro guy. And I found the discussion that you guys had between, you know, the earnings power of Tesla versus Hugh's point about the revenue trajectory of the business and of the company, uh, pretty interesting. So uh, I'll, I'll leave that to the interview in case anybody wants to go watch it. But the bottom line is uh, that you referred to the normalized earning power of companies like GM uh, and, and, and the other ICE companies. And so my question for you is, I guess, twofold. Is one, what do you think the cyclically normalized earnings power of Tesla could be? Um, and then two, do you think there's going to be more of a pronounced impact uh, from the IRA? I haven't really discussed that. So, you know, it, it obviously flows through into a couple of different areas, the $7,500 credit uh, and maybe the energy business. But, you know, if you look at things like First Solar, the company First Solar, which is which had previously been regarded, you know, as a commodity producer of, uh, of PV cells, the multiple on that, you know, revenue multiple, earnings multiple, whatever, has increased pretty significantly over the last six months. And so, yeah, I'm just wondering if you could comment on cyclically normalized earnings power uh, and the impact from IRA. And George, thanks again. Appreciate it. Well, so on to your first question, it's both they're they're similar. I, I would say that, and, and this is why I keep going back to Q4 as sort of a good indicator. I mean, Q4 macroeconomically was was still probably let's call it you know mid cycle to to strong mid cycle there was clearly no recession in q4 i mean unemployment you know was way down leaky claims had like a one handle right and and gdp growth came in real at like 2.9 i think so q4 was like aver and and still there was waiting lists for most cars they the inventory still hadn't built yet so I would take Tesla's Q4 earnings. I would um, subtract the 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 cost of those price cuts, which is what I've done, and you know then I would add a little bit more volume. Okay, so instead of annualized 1.62 million, let's give Tesla's 1.8 million, and that's how I came up, you know, with like 250 a share for this year. And and I, so to me, Tesla's normalized earnings are around. 
two fifty a share, you know, on a gap basis. And and we should point out, by the way, we didn't do this yet, but you know, Tesla Tesla's one point eight million for this year. Okay, that's only an eleven percent unit delivery increase over Q4's level annualized. Okay. That's we're we're almost at Toyota level of growth. I mean, the Tesla hyper growth days, you can't claim there's hyper growth when when they sold, you know, when, when you're saying they're only going to sell 11 percent more cars than they did in Q4. Right. On an on an annualized basis. So does that answer that question? Then your other the other question you had about about um, look, there's a lot of moving parts in, in the um, in the Inflation Reduction Act credits. But so to shortcut through all of that, I just said, OK. Tesla booked over 600 million in emission credits in Q4. I think that might be like the second most they ever booked or close to it. I mean, it's, it's a huge number. I'm willing to give them that number as an assumption going forward, just saying, OK, the emission credits are going to fade because people aren't going to need to other competitors aren't going to need to buy them. But then they will be getting these various IRA credits. I mean, Zach said that he thinks this year the IRA credits I think he said would be worth a couple of hundred million. I think I think he said one or two hundred million a quarter. Two hundred so, million a quarter. Okay, fine. So let's say I think they booked over six, right? Six fifty in emission credits. Let's right. say it goes from two. Let's say it triples. I'm pulling numbers out of my ass. I totally admit it. So let's just say that that going forward forever, they can book you know six hundred and fifty million a quarter in various government subsidy credits. I don't think it's ever going to be more than that. You know, so let's use that. So let's, that brings us back to annualizing Q4, subtracting the price cuts, and then annualizing that and coming up with 250 a share, something like that. Look, uh, uh, one thing about uh, one thing I need to mention about this IR, our IRA credit thing is uh, is is twofold. First of all, it, it depends on whether you are an individual who makes under one hundred fifty thousand dollars, you know, a year in gross income, or if you're, you know, a joint, you know, like a family head of the household who, who, you know, makes 300,000 gross income. And I, I tried to Google this and I think the best guesstimate I could come to it, it really, it's hard to find, but, um, it comes to like, you know, like 11 to 14% of the U S population. And that, that's a big number actually, if, if all those guys buy Teslas, but you know, who knows how much those guys will buy Tesla, especially in a recession. But the point is that um, the battery pack thing is, uh, one thing everybody needs to keep in mind is yes, they will earn money from, from the battery incentive, but um, they are currently using LFP imported from China um, LFP battery packs imported from China uh, for their Model 3 for the cheapest variants. And and that will most likely, I mean, um, due to Manchin, like bringing it up as an issue, um, that, that won't be counted. But the thing is, um, a battery pack's cost is 70% battery cells, 30% battery pack. The only thing that, that Tesla makes on, on a Tesla battery pack is the pack itself that's 30 percent. so my calculations show it's like 950 dollars per unit and that's not that much well they're trying to phase into into uh building their actually own battery factory which you know clearly not not much is going to happen more with it this year that 4680 thing by the way the, the way they're doing the 4680 it's my understanding there's no real advantage to speak of over the previous batteries like they had apparently promised some special cathode or something in battery day but they're actually just using conventional materials i'm no battery experts so they, no no not, they 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 completely are failing and if you look at all the 10 Qs, uh just just uh search for for the word uh cost of goods sold or a cost of automotive revenues every 10 q for for 2022 showed that they they um blamed um costs uh for rising per unit because of um this and that and this and that plus battery production costs and the thing is tesla cannot make batteries i mean to make batteries it's like you i mean it is so freaking complex that there's i can't believe that these guys are even trying to do it by themselves i mean it's don't like, they claim that they're making that they're consistently making uh uh, batteries for the equivalent of a thousand cars a week now, or, is, yeah, or am yeah, I missing? Yeah. 
but I, 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 I don't know. But what I'm saying is they, they, they have lost so much money on, on trying to make these 4680 cells when, when Panasonic is, is getting ready to sort of mass produce it. It's like, I can't understand why these guys are going to do it. And when they start losing money from the, from the auto business or when they see profits like dive like crazy, they're, 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 they're going to stop making these uh, uh, 4680 batteries. All right. So, you know, even in the best case, uh, if, even if they can make them themselves, I mean, and to keep in mind, obviously, this is only for the stuff deployed uh, in America, which is, you know, only one part of their market. And on the cars, it's only like, what, 35 percent of their sales or, or whatever. So it's not company wide. So Panasonic said they'll they'll split the credit. What I'm saying is you add it all up. I doubt it's going to total more than they got in Q4, which was over 600 million of, of credit. So that's why I'm using that as a baseline. Good point. That's that, that's excellent. Listen, guys, uh, Motorhead, Mark, you've been really, really generous with your uh, with your time. This has been a phenomenal space. We've been going at it for almost two and a half hours. Um, I've gotten a bunch of uh, messages from people saying, oh, this is a bear space, a bear den, whatever. I mean, we, everyone's allowed to come up and speak. It's been totally respectful. Um, I'm sure we'll have other spaces in the future about Tesla. This won't be the last one. This is not meant to be a Tesla bear den. What I would note, uh, bullish or bearish, what I would note here is, look, Motorhead may be wrong. I may be wrong. Mark Spiegel may be wrong. But we're talking about facts and figures. All right. Exactly. We're trying to talk about numbers. <laughs> we can all BS each other with narratives. <laughs> but I welcome anybody. In fact, the space would be much better. I think Mark wishes, I wish, Motorhead even gave me the names of a couple of you know, Tesla bulls to come into the room. Unfortunately, they had personal commitments. They couldn't come in here. We welcome them. We want them to come in here. But let's talk Let's talk numbers and, and fundamentals. <laughs> I mean, maybe Gary Black could join us sometime. It's about number. Listen, the, the market, you know, it's like it's like a Keynesian beauty contest. It's not it's not who's the most beautiful girl. It's who would the judges think will be the most beautiful girl. It's, and then it's a, Tesla's been like a giant kabuki production. So before one starts dealing in narratives, and I know this is an emotional subject, people get amped up about it. They can start throwing insults at each other. You first got to deal with reality. Then we can talk about how to deal with reality. And the problem, what I value about what the contribution Motorhead and Mark have both made, they've get, given a very serious, erstwhile, best effort to, to portray what they believe to be the fundamentals. Can they be wrong? Of course they can be wrong. And we welcome other points of view. Come with your models. Come with your numbers. Come with your fundamentals. Then once we can get into a serious, you know, bull bear, bit ass spread on what the fundamentals are, then we can go to the stock price and the narrative. Unfortunately, narrative and, 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 and number go up tends to be the substance of a lot of the bull arguments that i've come across i mean i'll i'll, I'll go to mark and to motorhead for last thoughts on that but that's i want to thank both of you because this has been a tremendous deep dive on the numbers it'll be interesting to see yeah. how the year plays out. so so mark i'll go to you and then finally motorhead yeah that, that, by, by the way or sorry mark yeah just one thing i wanted to say um you know i i do consider myself a tesla bull um you know i also have a deep respect for the wisdom of markets and price action um, and enough humility to know that, you know, you can be wrong for a long time. So with respect to facts and, and figures, you know, if anybody wants to look at my profile, I actually have a pinned tweet. This is from a week or two ago, uh, just showing a summary output from my model, you know, comps, earnings figures, um, just, just hard data, n no opinion, um, you know, n no narrative. So if anybody... Let me can I ask you a question as a as a bull who throw up figures, George? Do we have time here for me to ask him a question? Yeah, we, we certainly do, Mark. Let's just let's just keep it neutral, okay? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I want to ask him. Also, Go ahead. I just want to say ahead. also, I, I didn't come to you know impose my viewer narrative. I just I came to ask a question, so I wasn't expecting to discuss this, but but sure. Okay, so I think we can all agree that with every benefit, everything Tesla claimed that its gross margin, I think, according to Motorhead, was 25% in Q4. Can you and I both agree on that? 20%, excluding everything. No, I'm throwing in everything. Oh, yeah, okay, so 25.9, yeah. I can, what's, your, what's your name, Mr. Bull? I'm sorry, or whatever you want me to call you. Uh, yeah, I'm not Docs. You can just call me Future Investor, Future. It's good. All right, Future Investor. Can we both <laughs> yeah. agree that, that the gross margin in Q4 was 25%? 
Uh, I think I had a little bit south of there, maybe 22 and a half, but, but sure. Let, let's, All right. Let's, call let's say 23. Let's say 23. Can we both agree yeah. it was 23, including sure. everything? Okay. Yep. All right. Can we both agree that they produced the equivalent of 1.75 million cars a year in Q4? Can we both agree on that? Agreed. Okay. Can we both agree that Tesla said it will produce 1.8 million cars this year? 1.8 to 2. All right. Let's let's say 1.8 because that's the guidance or let's say two. Let, let's start with 1.8. OK, can we both agree that 1.8 million cars of production is, I believe, around three percent more than 1.75 million cars of production? OK, you with me so far? In other words, yeah. in other words, 1.8 million this year is three percent more production than, than, than the Q4 rate of production that had a 23% gross margin. Can we both agree with that? Agreed. Okay. Can we both agree that they cut prices by an average of around 12% this year versus Q4? You know, those, those figures get a, a little messy because I actually, you know, if you look at my model, which is pinned, I had a, a price cut, which is slightly greater than that. And then I think, uh, I think, Mark, you had already said that, you know, the average, the ASP expected by Tesla in 2023 is 47,000 versus somewhere around 53. Okay, listen, I'll, so let's cut to the number. chase. Yeah. Let's cut to the chase. Yeah, I'll be nice to you or with bulls. I'll say it's 12. I'll say it's 12,000. Okay. Sure. Great. So, okay, great. So can we both agree? I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, I'm 12%, not 12,000. I'm sorry. So, so can we both agree that if you're producing only 3% more cars this year than Q4 annualized, that there is no meaningful um, cost decrease via increased production because you're only producing 3% more cars. Can we both agree on that? that? That's a little bit tougher. I mean, just to be completely intellectually honest, that's tougher to say, right? Because we've had some ramp ups in 2022 um, no, no, you're making three percent more cars this year than you made in Q4. Three percent more, right? Can we agree on that? Sure. Yeah. Let's let's take that number. Okay. So, seeing as you're only making three percent more, there's no real additional economy of scale in producing three percent more cars. I think we can logically both agree on that. And yet, you're cutting prices by twelve percent from a 23% gross margin. So you tell me why the gross margin won't go from 23% to 11% for uh, the year 2023. Yeah, so it's, it's sort of the, the $64,000 question. So um, there's a couple things there. You know, one is, is you might be right. Um, <laughs> it, the, other, the other thing is, and, and this is hard to get a handle on. I, I took a stab at it uh, in my model. But COG should probably be coming down. Why? You know, just just deflation Why? from various uh, I'm sorry. I mean, all, that, all right, let me stop you. Deflation, yeah. deflation, deflation. Okay. The, the, the price of – I went through this on Twitter. There is, there is no, no – the, the total of commodity costs are no lower uh, now, and, I doubt, and they're only going to go up this year as China reopens than they were as an average – in Q4 on a net basis. There is no deflation in commodities. And I assume labor costs are going up. So you tell me specifically, how, how is, how is, where's the deflation versus Q4's average cost this year? You tell me. Well, if you look at where most commodities peaked, uh, say in you know, Q2, Q3. Not peaked, not peaked, Q4 versus now. Well. We're just, using Q4 just, as our analog. Well, well just, just just starting with commodity prices, not talking about Tesla. If you, if you just look at where commodities peak, Q2, Q3, numbers are down from there. And they're also- I, That's average. irrelevant. Q2, Q3 is irrelevant. Q4, they had a 23% gross margin with whatever the commodity prices were. Where are commodity prices now and in 2023 versus Q4? What, what, I'm, what I'm saying is there's a lag effect. So in Q4- what you may have been experiencing to an extent, not, not across the full company and not across the full uh, cost base, but you may have been experiencing an in, uh, a, uh, increase 
in input costs as a result of what the company has said is a six month lag. And so if I were modeling it, just the one thing that I would try to get, you know, very clear on, and admittedly it's difficult, um, but I would just try to make sure that you're not sh quote unquote short the notion of the company over the next three to six months experiencing the lag impact of commodities coming back down. Okay, great point. So, great yeah. point. So let's say this. Let's let's let me be generous and say that 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 lag would have made Q4 gross margins two percent higher. I think that's very generous uh, than they actually were. And I'll be very generous and say that they stay constant through 2023 on average. Some go up, some go down, whatever. OK, so let me revise that and say, why won't gross margins this year be um, be 23 percent minus 10%, let's say not minus 12%. Why won't gross margins this year, including your commodity stuff, generously be 13%? So the, the other, I think, things you need to just take into account are ramp up costs from the other two factories. So How is that relevant I, if they're only building 3% more cars this year than they built in Q4? Well, I'm saying, I'm saying ramp up costs. So there may be more DNA. But okay. in terms of actual cash, uh, that, that number could be lower and actually probably will be lower. And then we also don't know exactly but where the company is going to exit 2023 with respect to volumes. So if they do hit 2 million, you know, they're annualizing it, call it 1.8 or a little bit, yeah, 1.7, like you said, in Q4. Um, but that number could be higher as they execute. We're uh, but we're Q4. talking full year. Sorry. We're talking uh, guys, full let, year. Let, let, let me step in here, okay? Uh, um, um, I mean, I, I know what auto automakers are saying, okay? And I'll tell you what Tesla said. What this is what Zach Kirkhorn, you know, the CF, CFO of Tesla said, um, in terms of um, offsetting the price cuts on the Q4 conference call. He said um, they they see costs coming down or imp he, did, he didn't say costs coming down. He said improving um, because of logistics, um, expedites. Expedites are like air shipping parts because you got to like, you know, pump your volumes, uh, which is like ridiculous. Um, and um, and they also said um, that uh, that they're going to reduce uh, parts, co components costs. OK, now the, the what. This is like so hilarious because I mean I laughed myself silly when I heard that because um, if you I I used to be I, I was I was the top three ranked auto parts analyst when I was working on the sell side um, uh, a while ago and and um, the so I followed the parts space very closely the the part the parts suppliers globally globally are raising prices because they can't find enough labor. And they have to they have to increase their their hourly wages, and so there's no way if Tesla uh, assumes that their costs are going to come down because they can lower components prices, there's no way there's no way that the, the, the part suppliers are like in in a big shithole right now because because they can't find enough workers. I mean, working at a part supplying plant is like the worst job in the world. So if if the average you know tesla worker makes 25 dollars an hour uh it's going to be higher at the components maker all right and to pile so, on top of that they're only pre increasing production again three percent this year so there's no volume discount on on three percent more stuff on top of the higher costs that 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 a motorhead's talking about so i so i revert back to mr future investor and say why will gross margins be any higher than 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 13 percent this year so, so just like taking a step back again, you, you could very well be right. Um, one, one of I want to know why I'm wrong. Well, because hey, hey, Mark, so, Mark, so let me, Mark, yeah, Mark, yeah. Mark, Mark, I'll Mark. just answer. Yeah, well, yeah, hold I mean, on, hold on, future. One second, one second, one second. Yeah. Mark, it, it, it's, it's a little bit of it's two on one. Like, like myself, you're enthusiastic. I think this is very – look, we don't have to agree on what the – Yeah, I don't, I don't mean to be rude. I'm sorry. No, no, no. What I'm saying is I, I, I want to know I no. want to know how I'm not absolutely no, no. right, I guess is no, what I'm Mark, asking. Mark, 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 I think yeah. what's helpful here is not that we're going to – sides are going to agree, but we can we can flesh out the bid ass spread. In terms yes. Of, in other words, yeah. you, you've made clear the assumptions. You and Motorhead we were largely in agreement 
It made clear your assumptions, how you get to the point of view that you do. And Future is making clear how he gets his, the assumptions he's making to get to where he does. And everyone can make their own choice about whether or not, you know. So, Mark, so George, so, so, Mark, so, Mark, so, Mark, so Mark, let me, Mark, yeah. Mark, yeah. Mark, hold on, just hold on, just hold on. It's not about him pounding you into the ground to, to agree with him or vice versa. I understand. Yeah. I, I, I just want everyone in the room, for the benefit of everybody, to understand the bid ass spread. In other words, they can agree with you and Motorhead. They can agree with Future. It's just what do you have to believe to get to your numbers? What do you have to believe to, to get to his numbers? That's really the point of this room. All right. Yeah. I, so, I got so, it. And, I, and I'd like so, to get to a meeting of the minds with Future. So, Future, yeah. back no, over, no, back no, over, no, yeah. no, we're doing that. I'm, yeah. I'm just saying, give him the yeah. airspace. Okay, want, sorry. It's yeah. really not fair. And you're, okay. <laughs> just give him, give him the airspace to just lay it out. So, Future, I think you, you yeah. heard the bear case. And, and not that we're going to agree, we're just we're just going to agree sure. to understand each other, okay? Could yeah. you just, because you've heard these guys speaking for a couple of hours, could you just speak to where you differ from them in terms of how you get to your numbers versus their numbers? That would be helpful. Yeah, completely. So I guess two things. So coming into the call, uh, my number was around 450, um, which is obviously, you know, lower than the street, call it one or two months ago. And so obviously, the, you know, stock declined materially as a result of those downward revisions. Sorry, four, call, sorry, sorry, call, 450 and what? Sorry, in, in yeah, yeah, but, 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 but he was for non-GAAP ETS, which was just non lower than where the street was a few months ago. That's what he was okay, saying. Okay, right, right, right. right. so, Keep yeah. going, future. Keep going, keep going. Sure. So non-GAAP BPS. Um, and then following the call, you know, as I've, as I've said, you know, a couple times now, depending on what you want to believe and where the company exits, I could actually see, and sort of during the call, I did take my number maybe down closer to 350. So what I've been trying to say, Mark, is we're not in total disagreement. But for people at home, like the way, I think the simplest way to do it is just consider these two levers, um, which is if we go from a 53,000 ASP to 47, then that's 6,000. And if they sell 2 million vehicles, then that's 12 billion, which comes off of EBITDA. Right. That's that's just pure price. So so that margin uh, evaporates. So and they had been doing roughly 25 billion, 25 to 30 billion of EBITDA. So take, you know, 12 billion off the top of that number. And then the cogs last year were around 60, 65 billion. So back out whatever number you think uh, you, you think they'll benefit in terms of deflation, if any from that 60 billion number, and you'll get the net of 12 versus six. Um, so <clears throat> that's point number one. The, the, the reason, Mark, why I wanted to ask you uh, about your longer term sort of like. Oops, sorry, my headphone just died, but I'm back on speaker. Um, <clears throat> the reason why I wanted to ask you about your longer term cyclical projection for, you know, what could be Tesla's normalized um, earnings power is because I'm taking cues from other uh, analogs in the market. And one of the ones I'm looking at is TSM, um, Taiwan Semi. So I know that the margin profile is different and the valuation is different. But I can tell you last year, and like I follow semis and semi cap equipment, it was surprising to see Warren Buffett step in because Taiwan's under threat. You know, uh, pricing in that <laughs> sector had benefited hugely from supply chain and prices and so and i think after you listen to that call 2023 <laughs> is going to be a messy number but investors have started to price for 2025 normalized earnings power so what i'm saying right now i think there's a vigorous debate that could be in the market over is 2023 the low for tesla are they on their way back up or does this begin you know a precipitous decline uh, in earnings power that may not stop in 2023, that may keep going down. But regardless, I think it makes a little bit more sense to kind of look at things that way and to think about, you know, where they could exit uh, 2023. So that's more how I'm looking at it. And I can yes, you know, so, get more. Yeah, 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 future, I really appreciate that. And, and listen, we, we're here to learn from each other. I'm really glad you came up and, 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 and fleshed that out. I mean, People can, you know, look at your model uh, on your that you've got in your thread. It's your pinned tweet. And then they can look at Motorhead's work and Mark's work. 
And we're just better off for sharing views and especially different points of views. Again, I, you know, there are a lot of people tweeting complaining to the bear den. I'm really glad you came up and I'm glad that, you know, motorhead and Mark listened to you and, and we can agree to disagree. And we can, hey, we George, can, can I, can I please. at least reply to him? Let me reply to future. So, sure. um, uh, two things. First, um, I think you and I, Future, agreed because I, I gave in to you on commodities and, and, I, and I started with a, with a higher gross margin, et cetera, et cetera. I think we both agreed that, that gross margin, in, at least this year, should be somewhere in like the 13% range. I mean, do you disagree with the fact that, that based on all the inputs that we agreed on, that it should be around 13 for this year, for 2023? And then I'll get to your second point. It, it's it, I just feel like it's it's intellectually dishonest for, for me to give you anything other than a range, because what I think is going to happen is I think Q1 is probably going to be pretty low. Um, and as I keep saying, like, I, th I think as you get to the middle of the year, uh, some of the pressures could start to reverse. And, and in fact, they, they even said on the call that they, you know, they had done the initial. Hey, sorry, sorry, future. I got to butt in here. What is your Q1 estimate for for net income? One yet, for, for the consensus said, is like, three billion. I, I I'm at two billion. It, I mean, it's not going to be good. I mean, they just cut prices by fifteen percent. Don't you mean to don't don't mean to nail you down here? And if you don't know, then let's. let's yeah, just... yeah, Motorhead. Maybe we can tell you that one offline because I, I, I sure, it's, sure, a good, sure. it's a good question. Oh. But I think I think he was on a different thread. So let's just try to keep the mo going. Oh, so, oh, future, 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 keep going where you were. Go ahead. Well, I think it was me. I was addressing future. Oh, Mark. Oh, oh um, Mark. So, sorry, Mark. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. So, all right. I, I mean, what I'm hearing, what I heard from future is um, just to just to finish on that point. That I could be right, but I didn't hear any specific reason why I'd be wrong. Again, using Q4 for an analog and throwing in two extra points of margin for better commodity pricing. So, yeah, 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 yeah Mark. Let me just say. I mean, you. I'm, I'm going to be Switzerland here. Using his the way he laid it out, he he took 12 billion off gross margin. Which I mean, you're like me. You like asking questions. You know the answer to. Okay. So just playing future state back to future in his own words. 12 billion takes you from a hit on gross margin takes you from 25 to 13 or 26 to 14 or 24 to 12 whatever okay so it's so a point made on that okay so what is your second point or okay so we, so we agree that this year if you do that though then this year comes in at best at like three dollars a share i believe okay here's my other point when when he said you know um uh how do we know that this isn't the trough and it's going to get a lot better from here or better from here well here's my answer they had to cut prices uh let's call it 12 percent in order to increase sales by 11 percent, taking Q4 annualized, right, selling um, you know, 405,000 cars, which is 1.62 million a year, in order to get to 1.8 million, or you want to call it 2 million, I don't care, but th they had to cut prices 11 percent, I'm sorry, 12 percent to increase sales by, you know, 12 to 15 percent, okay? What's your next uh, trick, Mr. Houdini? You see where I'm going with that? Yeah. So a, a couple things. So I think I said, you know, on the fly that my estimate had, had been revised down to call it 350. And so if you want to do the quarter by quarter math, um, Q4 would annualize at 480, right? They did a buck 19, four times 480 or, you know, 476. And so if I'm telling you the number could potentially be 350, and I believe that there will be a sequential ramp up Q1 through Q4. And then I'm also telling you, I think Q1 will probably be light. You can sort of back in to like the fact that I'm agreeing with you. Q1 should be, you know, lower. Um, so no pushback there. I think higher level, what I'm trying to say, and like, I think, you know, Hugh Henry, don't mean to invoke his name since he's not here with us. And by the way, George, you're doing an incredible job moderating. So thank you. And thanks to Mark too. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And by, by the way, just on that point, it ain't easy guys. Cause you're all smart. Yeah. You're all enthusiastic. So you know, I appreciate everyone trying to stay to the middle. So keep at it. Keep going, guys. Go for it. Yeah. So, um, so Hugh Henry, you know, who I do not think is a bull by any stretch, and I think he, you know, tipped his cap that he's pretty bearish on Tesla and thinks it could go down. I, it just comes to, down to how are you going to look at the business? And I will tell you, going way back to 2019, 
Yeah, I first became interested in Tesla because forget about if they ever do robo taxi, maybe they won't. Forget about if they ever solve solve self driving. Don't want to get into that debate. I simply looked at the market cap of Tesla versus Uber and Lyft, and I thought to myself, you're literally getting every single other component of the business for free if you comp what they're saying they're going to do against the value that the market is is ascribing to uh, those two companies. So you needed to look at it in a slightly different way. And trust me, like I have a huge amount of respect for Jim Chanos. I mean, he's one of you know the smartest people, one of the smartest investors in the world. And in November 2019, he had published his comp set showing you know the EV to sales of Toyota and all the rest of them versus Tesla. And if you had valued Tesla that way, you know, it would have implied a, a number which is materially lower than where the stock was trading. But Mark, I guess what I'm trying to say is, you know, if you're a bull and if you want to see revenue increase, um, which ultimately has to be accompanied by earnings power and like some concept of cyclically normalized earnings power, then the sign that that demand has been increased materially by these price cuts probably emboldens your view a little bit. And it enables you to look through the very near term. So I think that's what the market's seeing. That, that's okay, I'm, conf- I'm confused here, uh, Future. Um, let, me, let me just go back to my question. In order to increase sales, according to their guidance, 11%, but call it 15%, I don't care. They had to cut prices 12%. How do they grow from here without cutting prices further? So let me, let, Mark, let, let me answer that. Let me answer that. Okay. I, I think the battle lines have been, have been or the, the points of difference have been drawn. Well, right we just there. left specifics and went yeah, sort yeah, of into no, generality. No, Mark, no, Mark, yeah. Mark, 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 Mark. I'm, I'm, I'm agreeing with both of you. Okay. I'm trying to frame it in a way. It's not one guy bashing the other guy over the head to submit. It's just like, it's like we're trying to get what's in the market's head, right? If it turns out that you are right, forget about 23. Let's assume that. You know, it's going to be a down year for Tesla. I mean, even even futures acknowledging that maybe three fifty, whatever. Okay, so let's so let's say it's a down year. It's a buck fifty. It's three fifty. It's two fifty. Whatever it is. Okay. The real question is, markets look ahead, and if you're right, and Motorhead's right, that this is a preview and and and, and, and the things to come. That you know, it is one of the other smart. I think Joe mentioned um, that you know, it's, it is. They're going to have to continually cut more prices to grow to grow volumes because increasing competition, so on and so forth, all right, then you're going to be right on that, and, 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 and it's, the earnings will be, it's not just 23 is going to be a bad year, but 24, 25, going forward, and it is over, okay? That's one way, all right? On the other hand, on the other hand, I think this is where future is going. If it turns out that, in, in, you know, I don't mind saying that I kind of tend to side with your view, but we can, I'm trying to understand what future saying on the other side. If, on the other hand, this is just sort of a one-off, so to speak, in that looking ahead, they can continue to grow volumes at, you know, 40, 50%, whatever the number is going to be, without having to cut prices, then the market will, the price will go in a very different direction. All right. So, George. So, Mark, 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 let me finish. Let me finish. <laughs> you, don't, you don't believe in that scenario. Motorhead doesn't believe in that scenario. Why I should I? I? No, I'm not saying you should. I'm well, that's saying- what I'm asking. That's what I'm asking future, because if they had to cut prices 12 percent to grow 11 percent, why should I believe it should be any different well, in the future? I, that's I, all I, I'm I, asking. But, that, but, that, but that's, that's a that's again, that's the value of this space is not the, everyone agreeing. It, it's it's pitching the, the, what the two scenarios are. And, and you've made you've made your point. I mean, I don't know, if future, if you have a response to that or not. I'm looking for data behind behind yeah, the so, alternative scenario. Yeah, yeah fine, fine. So, it's the future. Could could you? Would you care to throw an answer at that? Yeah, I mean, well, the most you know recent hard data we have is the is the Troy test like uh, data, and then we have the comments on the conference call, and so you sort of just need to assess the credibility of what they're saying. And um, you know, look, I, I understand your position on the company, and you know, on on Elon and. Uh, you're at the bones that you pick with the way they guide and the way they communicate. Um, it might be somewhere in the middle, but I don't think like what they're saying is they are receiving orders, which are two X productive. Yep. I would push back on the 11%. And just, just to close out the thought and I'll turn it to you. I, you know, I saw some of your, your work on, well, they may be referring to simply inventory or, 
the production rate is well below normalized in January because of the fact that they haven't been experiencing as much demand. You know, that also may be possible. So I'm, you know, I, I don't think I'm pushing back on what you're saying as much as you think I do, because as George says, I mean, our numbers are relatively close. Um, and there's some variability in my numbers. Like, you know, you got to update your estimates. I mean, facts change, change your mind. Um, so we'll see how they exit the year and we'll see what type of trajectory we're on. But I really do think, you know, let's look at Hugh Henry, who's a, a non-biased macro guy. I mean, he's looking at different factors than Q1 EPS. And, you know, people like that do drive flows. So future, a yeah. few things. First of all, you said the most recent hard data we have is, I believe you said, is Troy's tracker and the comments on the conference call. That's not hard data, especially coming from Tesla, which always misses its comments on the call. And, you know, Musk makes his comments and then dumb stock the next day. The most recent hard data we have is the Q4 numbers, okay, which I think you and I both agreed because we made our adjustments. I think I made them basically in your favor on costs and stuff. So the hard data is the Q4 numbers. The hard data is the price cuts combined with Tesla's guidance. Admittedly, that's guidance isn't hard data either, but Tesla has never been known, you know, to under guide. So when we put all that together, I return back because I thought we were having a data driven or a fact driven or opinions based on facts driven discussion here. Why do you think Tesla can grow beyond the 2023 uh, guidance without additional price cuts? So let me just say, why do you think they can grow at a rate that would justify, you know, one third of the price, you know, that it's selling for much less the price? Where's the growth going to come from without more cuts? If they're only growing, I say 11% based on their own guidance, but if you want to say 15 or 20, I don't care. Where's the growth coming next? Why do you think it will grow? I mean, a fact-based discussion, not, not, you know, not bullshit from, from comments on the, which, which are nonsense from those guys. We have the facts, we have Q4, and we have the price cuts. Go ahead. Yeah, but before you answer the future, I don't know if you were in this space. Uh, we're going to we're gonna, we're gonna one more one more speaker, and we're going to close this room. I don't know if you're in the space couple hours ago when we were talking about how uh, Motorhead and, and Mark were pointing out how Musk at times is parsimonious with the truth to put it um, uh, mildly like like he'll talk about demand surging yeah it may have surged in the last hour compared to the hour <laughs> the day before so we, we he's very good at framing his comments in a way which if he's not lying he's lying by omission if not commissions so I don't know if you heard that part but go ahead future yeah yeah um no, I, I, I did. And um, so, so, you know, Mark, I, I heard you discuss the Market Wizards book and how if you tab through the various chapters, you can find, you know, macro, fundamental, bottoms up, top down, um, and traders who look at things on different time frames and regard different factors as, as being important at different times. So I, I think, you know, we're, we're talking maybe a little bit past each other. So that's my fault. I'll, you know, I'll try to, to address your questions more specifically. Um, but big picture, th this gets really rabbit holy, and maybe this space isn't the time and the place for it, but Tesla's medium and long-term plan is to cut prices. And so I'm like, you know, I grew up sort of learning about industrial companies and normalized EPS and earnings power and incremental margins. Um, and Tesla, like really wasn't considered an industrial company uh, for a long time. It's like people that covered autos, they didn't cover Tesla, they didn't pay attention to it. It just kind of didn't check any of the normal boxes. Like, you know, what is it? Um, and so it, it sort of depends on how you look at things. And as I said, like what you think the normalized earnings power is going to be and what you think the, the growth trajectory is going to be. Right. And I, 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 listen, I, I think we've laid out the, you know, the old thing. Sorry, sorry. Just, 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 sorry, just one thing. So one thing I think is really interesting and because you actually, you get into this a little bit more in like commodities land and hard industrials and basic materials land, but you need to consider um, the idea of a cost curve and, and also demand at various uh, price points. And so I actually have a couple images pasted. I think this is from Cantro's firm actually. But they did a lot of work on showing demand for vehicles at, at relative price points. 
And, you know, any reasonable analysis of that cost curve or that demand curve rather will show you that demand will potentially like really, really explode uh, with marginal cost cuts. Okay. Um, I, 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 sorry. Sorry. But, you're just but let look. Me, you're, but let you're, me, you're totally. Yeah. No, right, just, no, no, no. Totally I just, I wrong. Thing, and then you can you can push back on the, the only other thing I want to point out is if you look at the long term cost curve of an ICE vehicle engine, those numbers have pretty much flattened out. And because EV is so much earlier in its cycle, um, costs are still coming down. And so I have a very long term model, you know, on Tesla, which I can publish and I compare like what they say at various points during their life cycle to what they actually end up putting up with respect to numbers and what you can see is a very clear look it's bumpy quarter to quarter and they don't always make their projections granted um but what you can see is a very clear trend of the company uh moving down the cost curve in terms of cost per unit and profitability per unit going up and they could potentially still be really really early on in that phase if they're ultimately going to get to a five, eight, you know, 10 million vehicle run rate type of production. So that's, I think, the more important debate. Like, if you think they've sold the most vehicles they're ever going to sell, the debate's probably over, you know, bears win. If you think they're going to continue to sell more, it, it's more open-ended. Let me tell you two things right now, okay? If the entire world switched over to uh, uh, let's not talk about the entire world. Let's talk about America. Right. Which has the shittiest fucking in infrastructure in the world. If they were to switch 100 percent to EVs, the, you would you would have no fucking power. You would have power outages. OK. And that's what that's what the, the chairman of uh, the, you know, the owner of, of Toyota said is like, you know, if we in Japan were to switch over to EVs, we, we, we wouldn't have any more power. And it's true. It's even truer in America because they have a less, um, you know, uh, supplied infrastructure uh, for for the power grid than than Japan does. Japan, like, you know, I mean, there's it's a socialist country. They they. They make people work by, you know, you know, renewing infrastructure. So, I mean, if everybody switched to EVs tomorrow, yeah, I mean, th there wouldn't be enough power. OK, number one. Number two, um, the uh, lithium supply deficit is it was only two, two thousand tons in 2022. OK, that's growing to forty six thousand tons in this year. And by 2025, the lithium supply deficit will be 154,000 tons. OK, who's going to buy the price of an EV will be like Ferraris. And this yeah. is why I think I, I, this is why I think that Toyota, um, who I mean, it's like it's like really hilarious to see that, you know, that the the, the son of the grandfather who who who, you know, founded Toyota. Um, just had to step aside because he's like, you know, they're 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 like, OK, you haven't done enough on EVs and blah, blah, blah. And it's like he was actually right. He is like it's like there's not enough there's not enough power in the grid to have everybody switch to electric. And I think I, I think um, especially Mark, by the way, yeah, get rid of your Stellantis and Volkswagen. I mean, um, <laughs> get 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 Toyota, because I mean, these guys, when the grid breaks down or lithium is just too expensive where by the way the average price of a battery electric vehicle last year was sixty six thousand dollars okay who who's gonna buy that shit i mean you know even if you know especially if oil prices come down or they go up it doesn't matter nobody can fucking afford that and 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 so the point is is like so toyota is right they've got their hands they've got their hands both in uh, not both, but they've got their hands in like hybrids, ice, um, plug-in hybrids, and and electric vehicles. But they they're actually smarter than Volkswagen. Um, that that's a that's a those are great big picture points. And then and then, but I just want to step in for a second, and I agree with all that stuff except about Stellantis and Volkswagen because only a small part of what they do is even. That's a, not, forget it. That's a different topic. I just want to get back to to Mr. Future. Um, um, I want to say this, Mr. Future and I 
agreed that based on Tesla's guidance, in the best possible case, earnings uh, this year were a three handle. After that, and by the way, Q4 gross margin was lower than full year 22 gross margin slightly, I believe, if I remember right. Um, wh wh after that, this is why we can't discuss anymore here. And I don't mean this pejoratively. Future sort of goes into fantasy land. I mean, we both agree that they had to cut prices 12 percent to get to 1.8 million cars. He thinks it's 2 million, whatever, but whatever it is. OK. And then Mark, beyond Mark, that, Mark, he Mark, starts Mark, saying, Mark, Mark, yeah. Mark, please. Sorry. 15 percent. OK. Do it on a weighted average because. OK. 15 percent. OK. Yes. Yeah, and then beyond that, our Model Y. And OK. The price in the Model Y by 20 percent. OK, fine. Good. Right. And then beyond that, Mr. Future says, now we got these curves and to get to 5 million cars. Okay, that is and I don't mean this pejoratively to you, but that gets into non fact based sort of test lemming, you know, fantasy land where th now we're back to we where we can't discuss anything because you're agreeing with me that it's a let's say you roughly agree with me that it's at best maybe a three dollar or you want to say three and change earner. And then you're saying. But, but, but I'm making up all these fantasies about why costs will keep coming down, blah, 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 when they're not selling very many more cars despite a huge price cut. So we can't really go beyond that because now we're getting into Ross right, Gerber. Right, 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 so hold on, Mark, Mark, Mark. Let's just turn it down. Let's just turn it down. Um, it's clear the scenario, the assumptions that you and Motorhead have about the future. It's clear alternatively the assumptions that future is made. I welcome him. I thank him for his contributions because one always needs to be self-reflective about what could go right, what could go wrong. I mean, you know, as an aside, clearly I haven't done very well the last few weeks. So um, I, you know, I don't want to excoriate him. I welcome him. Everyone can meet their own conclusion as to which one's more um, uh, likely or reasonable. I, there's no need to, you know, say anything more than that. Um, you know, I, I think we've agreed on what the key, the kernel, even more important than what the earnings are in 23, is what does it pretend for the future? If this is a company, which then we're just the last one we're going to have on this, and then we're going to the Carter for the final word. You know, if this company needs to continuously cut prices to drive volume at ever slower rates uh, because of the increasing competition, um, then it's game over for, for the stock. If, on the other hand, this is just the lull and the, and the costs really keep collapsing and the unit, you know, in the, in the unit growth is going to continue to, to be very buoyant. Um, then so be it. I mean, I, I think the lines of engagement, the battle lines, if you will, have clearly been drawn. All right. Everyone can reach their own conclusion. It'll be interesting to see how it plays out. Obviously you and motor had of your point of view. I can decide with you, but I welcome future for him laying out. Oh, how could we be wrong? You may describe, you may think his scenario is very unlikely. Fine. But at least we know, at least we know what the other side is. And I thank Future for articulating that. Um, okay, so the Carter, do you have a word or two you'd like to add? Otherwise, the space has been going for three hours. Um, I don't really want to open it up into brave new subjects. But if you have a brief comment you'd like to make, I, I'll give you the last word. No, thanks, George. Um, yeah, I was just going to say it, it seems like the direction of Tesla's stock price really uh, comes down to the direction of macro. And... I don't know. I, I don't know if you want to let Cantro get into this, but um, the market is really trading as if it's early cycle. And I'm curious from Cantro's perspective if uh, his view has changed on that at all. Um, if it's not, if so, 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 Carter, why don't we do this? I mean, Cantro, if you're available and can weigh in for a second, great. Um, and or Carter, why don't you just give your two cents about what you think is going on? I don't know. Cantor has to take care of his research department, his daughters, so that's 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 number one priority. But Carter, I think you have a couple of thoughts, and if Cantor can join, that's great. But Carter, I'll give you the last word. Uh, yeah, I would just anyone that's familiar with my feed would know I'm pretty uh, focused on the Fed at the moment, and I just I don't think the Fed can allow the cycle to be early to be early cycle. I think that's inflation is going to come back in a pretty big way if they just allow that to happen. Um, so I. I tend to, I tend to think this is a, a massively overbought market in <clears throat> in the context of uh, you could view it as an ongoing bear market, or um, I, I, I tend to tend to think we may the real bear actually may just be getting going. I think there are a ton of confusing signals, um, 
And Cantor just has a really great framework for dealing with that. So that's what I just saw he came up. So, 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 so Cantor, the man, is here. Uh, we, 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 we yield to Michael. Michael, good to see you. You've, uh, you got away from your research department. You got some words of wisdom for us? Um, maybe. Uh, can you hear me? We got you. Um, yeah, so, you know, I would just say, you know, instead of trying to pontificate about the future, you know, there's a lot going on right now that always happens around when the market starts to price out the Fed tightening cycle. And, you know, I think a lot of the move in Tesla has a little to do with Tesla. Uh, Because when you see all of these companies that got crushed last year rally in the same time, in the same way, it's got nothing to do with one of them and all to do with all of them in that it is a macro story. You know, obviously the magnitudes will be different depending on the idiosyncratics of the company, but I mean, let's face it, it's been one big move, uh, certainly in the last few weeks, the first three weeks of this year, four weeks of the year, in a lot of these beaten down companies. Um, so to me, you know, when you see that, it's, it's, you know, it's not a debate about one company or the other, even though I understand that's the point of this space, but I think it's just uh, – it should be acknowledged that there's a huge aspect of macro in terms of what's going on with each, within each one of these companies. Um, I think ultimately we can sum up the last three months. I think it's a bear market rally that has to do with discounting out the three biggest risks facing the market three months ago, which were China, Europe, you know, energy crisis potentially, and the Fed rates the dollar inflation, you know, which is all one big uh, bowl of soup. So those three things, you know, have all been massively, in the eyes of investors, alleviated. And obviously China's back, coming back uh, online and weather's been warm. So that, you know, that I think in hindsight makes sense. And then I'll also say a lot of, you know, what uh, I think the power of what the market's priced in with discounting out the, out the Fed is something, you know, you always see a junk rally around when that happens. And, you know, maybe one of the parallels to look at is the pocket in March of 2000, sorry, May of 2000 through September of 2000, where you had a very similar moonshot move and a lot of low quality junk that was in bubble territory that had come down hard and bounced back. Uh, you did see that in a little bit in 06 when the Fed stopped in June of 06. Uh, you saw it in uh, 95. So I'm not saying what, what I'm trying to say, I guess, is that I think it's more about that shift in risks and pricing out the Fed than an indication that there's been a major macro shift beyond the market's perception of the Fed. So more reaction territory than that the market's forward-looking to anything other than we've, we're no longer panicking about inflation. I'm not saying where it's going, but I think it's an important point to acknowledge, understanding is this, you know, how much of this is unusual, never happens, versus how much of this type of behavior always happens. And in my opinion, a lot of it's the latter. Thanks for that, Michael. Carr, do you have a, a last word you want to uh, respond to, Michael? Can, Michael, uh, I guess because I would end end by asking you, Michael, um, in those historical instances where these junk rallies have failed, did you see a similar package of breadth thrust signals and credit markets healing, or does does the whole does the entirety of the the current macro backdrop? backdrop fit with those times that have failed anytime the fed has been done tightening interest rates or the market you know in this case thinks they're done or act is act, is acting as if um yes you get a tightening in credit spreads it is all p expansion and equities on the back of bond yields housing stocks rip they ripped 40 percent in june 06 to february 07 they weren't looking forward to anything. They were just reacting to lower mortgage rates, as they've done today, uh, in my opinion. Uh, so, yeah, you get this 
uh, rally that starts off often as a junker rally, which is, you know, it's often it's hard to tell what a uh, differentiating a bear market rally from a new a new low, really a new permanent low in the market, if you don't really have any kind of process or framework, because they very much look similar. And I would even extend that to you don't know if we are heading into a soft landing or a hard landing today or at any other point historically, unless you have some forward-looking framework, because it very much looks and acts the same. And sentiment, you know, I remember 06 and 07, and I have studied, you know, I started right after the tech bubble, um, but I study, have studied that, talked to plenty of people, and heard plenty of people talk about it, worked with plenty of people talk about it. You know, people were talking about and seeing markets going back to, a lot of stocks going back to new highs in the summer of uh, 2000. So, again, this is not unusual. People don't change. Um, a lot of it's behavioral. But, yeah, we've taken, we've, we've reduced the threat of three major issues, China, European imminent crisis, and um, a wildly hawkish Fed. But that doesn't mean we're going to have a soft landing or hard landing in, 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 in retrospect yet. It's that, that doesn't tell us where we're going. Housing stocks ripping 40%, the housing data bouncing. That literally always happens when the Fed's done raising rates as mortgage rates start to come down. But it doesn't tell you or it doesn't delineate between what's going to happen ahead of us. So, um, I, you know, again, I, didn't, I have my views that are very clear. But what I really want to emphasize is that this, a lot of this action is stuff you always see around the end of a tightening cycle, whether or not we're there or not and whether or not a hard or soft landing is coming in 3, 6, 9, 12, or 15 months. No, that's very helpful. Thank you. I don't, I don't have anything to add to that. I mean, at the end of the day, every, forward-looking indicators of policy have not been digested. Earnings estimates are stagnant to lower, stagnant at best, lower at, at most. And we're seeing more and more layoff announcements and um, – more and more negative earnings revisions. Uh, and again, China coming back online doesn't, uh, I don't think is going to be the game changer that it has been in previous low points in the macro cycle when they came back, you know, roaring in terms of demand. That's, that is not the Chinese, you know, we don't, the Chinese economy today is not what it was in 2011 or in 09. All right. With that, this room has gone on far longer than I anticipated. I want to thank um, everyone. Um, Motorhead, Mark, Future, Carter, Cantro. Uh, we're all here to learn from each other. And um, nobody's got a monopoly on the truth. That's for darn sure. So, um, uh, George, can I just say one last thing? Sure. Um, there were a lot of... Um, uh, Tesla fanboys who wanted to join this space. It was it was retweeted while we were talking, yeah. and they're all blocked. So um, I'm I'm thinking um, because I've I, I've had so many people. So like I published a I I, I tweeted that I'm sh you know I'm I'm long the Tesla puts at one thirty and all this stuff and and they've all destroyed me this week. You know of course I mean I got killed, but the thing is um, there's a tesla q uh block list and i'm thinking about deactivating it just to let everybody you know join and there are a lot of people who wanted to join the space tonight but um they're blocked by you and by me no so, I, I i have not subscribed to any tesla q uh block list maybe you have i have not um the people i block are people who i, I am all for respectful uh points of view i'm not for um vitriol and trash talking and when someone trash talks on me i block them but i have not subscribed to any any list perhaps you have so i don't know anything about a the list reason, the reason i'm bringing this up is um there's this um huge account um stock stock talk talk week and and that th they're the ones who hosted that um uh that space where Elon Musk said that they might make low to negative margins, yes. And and, and so the thing is, I couldn't get on that because Holmar's blog was was um you know Omar Kazi was was a co-host of that, and um 
he said, like, you're, you're good to go. But I couldn't get on that because um, Holmar's blog, you know, blocked me. So I'm saying that I think I think I, I'm, I'm personally thinking of just unblocking everybody. Have you subscribed to an en masse block list? Yeah, it, it's created by. Uh, okay. Oh, okay, well, I, I think Motorhead, I would urge you to do that because I think that's the source of the problem. Okay. Uh, I, I have blocked some people individually. I never block anyone for difference of opinion. I block people for ad hominem personal attacks and trash talking. And unfortunately, Twitter is a real sewer. Um, yes, I have attacked some people, but I've never gone after anybody for bad performance. Um, I've gone after people for lying and violating securities laws. But, you know, this is a hard business. I've said it many times. And unfortunately, there's just a lot of uh, bad actors out there who cannot control themselves and just engage in ad hominem personal attacks for no reason whatsoever. So, Motorhead, if you if you have subscribed to a, a, a block list on mass, I think you should um, un unsubscribe to that. Uh, I, I am not the source of, 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 of that issue. So I, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, all right. So with that, we've been at this for over three hours and 15 minutes. I want to thank again, everyone. This has been a great space and um, we'll do it again at some point. We clearly, and, and again, thanks, thanks to the, 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 um, uh, the talk the last hour hearing from the bull side is very helpful. Everyone can reach their own conclusions and we'll know what to look for as the down cards get turned up. So, Again, thanks, everyone. We'll be doing a space next week. Good to be back. Everyone take care. Bye-bye.